Good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, welcome to the spring 2022 FPA planning meeting. Um, I suppose I should do this so that you can see that I haven't shaved today. I'm Matt Franzak. I'm along with my good friend and uh, and and colleague Matthias Steiner, the co-chair for the Friends and Partners in Aviation Weather. And um, as as we have seemingly started doing over the last couple of meetings, um, um, Matthias uh, and I both have pictures that uh, that either depict what we're doing or what we would like to be doing in my case. Matthias, in fact, and his wife Mary are in that particular rig somewhere in uh, New Mexico. Um, and um, between the fact that today's journey um, has them in weak cell coverage and that Mary has expressed a desire for Matthias to do the driving in whatever mountainous region they're in today. I do not expect uh, to hear Matthias join the meeting. Therefore, I'm flying solo. Um, I would like to be at the lake. I live in metro Atlanta, and the, the lake uh, in this case is Jackson Lake, which is in kind of central Georgia, about 40 miles as the crow flies-ish southeast of downtown Atlanta. Uh, unfortunately, I'm, I'm here today with you all, and not unfortunately, I, that, that came out terribly. I'm here today with you all of my own free will and accord, and plus, even if I was at the lake, it's in the mid 50s and would not be nearly the type of weather that, um, uh, that it was when my three grandkids were tube riding year before last and, uh, and their evil malevolent grandfather found this perfect tidal wave to, 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 uh, to zip the, uh, the float over and eject one who you can't see in the picture there, launch the middle one and cause number three to look concerned for her very life, which in fact, she probably should have been. Uh, but uh, so, so that's, that's what we have. That's what we have going on here in FPAR world. It looks like we have how many folks, you know, why don't they have a number? Well, we have, I'm, I'm just going to say we have a, oh, 24 folks. So that, that is a goodly number for, uh, for an FPA planning meeting to at least begin with. Hopefully there'll be some others dribbling in. Um, let, me, uh, let me continue on and, and um, uh, just throw out there for your, uh, for your uh, consideration that the fall 2021 FPA meeting is currently planned to take place on October 5th, 6th, and 7th, that is, as has been the case recently, a Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Right now, we are planning for it to be in person and virtual at the MITRE 4 Auditorium in McLean, Virginia. If circumstances preclude the in-person portion of that meeting, then it will be completely virtual and again, on those same dates. So I guess, well, the TBD that's there is we don't know yet today, as of this instant in time, whether we're going to be able to conduct a virtual meeting at MITRE uh, on those dates in October, uh, or whether we will have to be virtual once again. And let me pause there. Uh, well, let me provide one more piece of input. Uh, feedback and and then let me pause and let's talk about this as a group for for just a little bit. Uh, MITRE um, on Monday, the CEO of MITRE, Jason Provodakis, um, uh, announced uh, at his weekly CEO brief, which by the way, tip of the hat to Jason Provodakis, he's been doing this nearly weekly since the pandemic started uh, with with all MITRE employees. Uh, he announced that on June the 1st, MITRE is going to transition from, from the uh, uh, COVID phase zero plus stat status uh, to a modified COVID phase two status, which is, in so many words, a relaxing of, of, um, of some of the criteria that have been uh, used basically almost since the very beginning of, of the pandemic. And so uh, that's a long way of saying, I see that as a as, as at least one 
kind of positive sign that maybe just maybe, um, you know, we will by midsummer know that we can conduct our fall FPAW meeting in person uh, at the MITRE campus on the, the dates that are listed there. As a forecaster, and many of you are forecasters too, and, and I think know and appreciate what I'm talking about, if I was forced to make this forecast today, I, I, would, I would make a forecast that, that we're not going to be able to do it. But I, I really don't want to make the forecast today because I think that, that there's at least enough of a possibility to justify stringing this along a little bit further if we can. And now I will shut up and open the floor to anybody who would like to make some comments, observations, some, some guesses as to what they think is going on or going to happen, I should say. Is the thought that uh, if MITRE is not open for in-person meeting business at that point that it would just go strictly virtual or is there a fallback uh, venue? Uh, the latter, uh, no, sorry, sorry, the former. <laughs> uh, if, if we can't do the meeting in person at MITRE, leaving the, the assumption there, Dave, is that if we can't do it at MITRE, we can't do it anywhere. Um, and, and therefore we would go completely virtual, yes. Anybody else have looking for a, I was looking for a trip to Colorado. <laughs> well, Matt, yes, sir. Hey, man, this is Randy. So hey. when, when you say string along, I mean, we, we got to have a drop dead date sometime. What what do you envision that to be? And I and, and I'll preface that by saying, um, you know, we're starting to look at potential trips and travel again. Um, you know, for, for one thing, you've got the uh, the turbulence workshop at the beginning of September. Um, what I really think is going to be kind of the bellwether is Air Venture in Oshkosh in July, because the FAA is still planning right now to attend that in person, but uh, we don't know how many people they're going to allow or if they're going to come up and say, no, we're going to make it local again, just like they did for uh, Sun and Fun. Um, or local for you know FAA employees in that area, um, you know. But that's you know mid July. Is that too late to to make a decision on going forward? So you know, we we kind of need to know those things sooner rather than later, I guess, before we make a, or, you know, bef before we set on a path and get too far down the road and camp back out. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I hear you loud and clear, Randy, and I know you know that I hear you loud and clear. And and uh, you know, there's there's a part of me that that wants to make this decision today because then we can you know we can lock stuff in place and and plan around it and go. Um, and there's another part of me that 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 is holding out hope that that we might be able to meet in person. I don't. I don't know about the turbulence meeting. I know Tammy's on. I can see. I can see her here. I. I just don't know about that. 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 That to me feels early. But. But this one month and 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 a week later somehow feels like it might be doable. But I don't know when we'll know that. And 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 you know, given your role in the fall, the the potential fall meeting, Randy. I know you want to know sooner rather than later, so that so that you know you understand how how your life is going to be in that time period. All right, and it, yeah, and it, like I said, it's not just you know even even if we decide to push for it, you know, we still don't have any FAA guidance on you know attending meetings, you know, offsite and things like that. So it's there, there's a there's a whole lot of moving pieces to this thing right now, and unfortunately, I don't I don't know if those moving pieces are converging or diverging or you know in total chaos. <laughs> I think it's the latter. <laughs> uh, although although maybe again you know maybe my 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 tragic optimism suggests that that perhaps they are converging 
slowly, uh, you know, in, into an answer. I, so, so let me let me let me just throw this out to the group. Oh, we got somebody with their hand up. Do we? Yeah, Who's... Andy has got his hand up there. Andy McClure. Andy McClure. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, um, Glory. Just as a a footnote to the whole uh, in person meeting stuff. Um, we were planning on attending the uh, Great Alaska Aviation Gathering this past weekend and the Valdez Stole Competition to uh, be able to do a little outreach in person. And we were told by a regional council that that was still forbidden, both of them. And uh, so, you know, I'd, I'd like to see something happen you know, things have been pretty quiet up here in Alaska for a while on the COVID front, I think, but uh, still no significant movement at our end. Yeah, yeah, that 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 basically matches, I think, what everybody else is is experiencing, Andy. It's not just an FAA situation. I know at MITRE, you know, we can do domestic travel now without uh, without getting you know senior executive approval provided that uh, that we are vaccinated and and mm. um so that so that's that's good but there's a caveat that goes with it which is that if you're if you're planning to go to a large meeting with many people um that, that's not going to be following social distances social distancing and using npis then then we're not going to uh, you know th then you can't you shouldn't do that then you will need approval to go to that event. You don't need approval to travel to it, but you're gonna need approval to go to it. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, so. Uh, so yeah, yeah, I, what I did notice got? also uh, on your agenda that's on screen, um, it looks like the FPA fall meeting, if and when it takes place in person, is uh, no longer attached to NBAA. Is that true? Uh, th that is true. This, the, the, this, this fall, anyhow, it is not attached to NBAA. It was not clearly last fall since, uh, yeah. since uh, you know, we, we um, so, so, yes. And, and um, um, I, I don't, I don't know how many of you recall a couple of years ago, the conversations that we had at the FPA meetings um, and and you know finding out that um, unbeknownst frankly to me and and again my naivete uh, you know and NBAA was 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 throwing in a significant sum of money to host us at their business and mm. uh, business aircraft convention and, and exposition each year and and uh, um, you know had to make a difficult decision to to weigh. Uh, cost and benefit. In the end of the day, the cost seemed greater than the benefit that that they were receiving from FPA, and and so uh, so that that auto association uh, no longer is there. That doesn't mean it won't be, can't be in the future, and that doesn't mean that NBAA thinks any less of us. I'm putting words in your mouth here now, John, but and and correct me if I'm I'm wrong. But but that right now we're 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 on our own uh, for both of our meetings each year. Okay. Yeah, I, I do recall hearing that, but just sort of checking because I saw the first uh, notice of the NBAA fall meeting in my email box yesterday. Yep. yep. Thank you. Yep. So um, I'd like to go back just, just to get uh, a, a sense of um, um maybe what the group thinks and there are what 36 people here so um so let me let me I, I have to do this in a way that that you know that will work for folks so so let me let me uh let me ask for a show of hands using the little the little you know raise your hand mechanism how many people think that we should make a decision about the location and and format of the fall FPA meeting today. Raise your hands if you fall into that group, please.
Looks like nine so far. Yeah, it looks like nine so far. Two, four, six, eight, nine. Very good. Okay. Uh, hang on a second. I, I got to write this down. Today equals nine. How about if I ask, uh, by the way, lo lower, your, lower your hands now, folks, please, if you can. Otherwise, I, I will. And if I lower your hands, I also, uh, you're at risk of being deleted from the meeting if I press the wrong button. Uh, let's see. Uh, all right. Let me ask the same question, ask for the same response. Um, how many folks would be in favor of making a decision about the fall FPA location? What day is today? The 12th? Um, I I'm going to just say on June the 1st. Is it worth saying what other options might be in your questionnaire? <laughs> I, I don't know. Is that, the, is that is that the late? Are you okay? You're you're winging it. That's fine. Uh, yeah, I'm 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 absolutely winging it. <laughs> yeah, if, if there's going to be at least one more. Yeah, I'm like going to suggest end of June, um, because that gives us three full months plus a week, uh, before the actual product has to be put on somewhere. Okay. Uh, okay. I, I think regardless, it's going to have to be the way you have it represented right now. The plan is to be in person on that date, but possibly that you know that could be over overridden by events. Yeah. 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 Okay. And and so let me let me let me throw one more option out there then. And by the way, how how many how many uh, I I counted I think four, including me. So I saw five. You saw five. five. Okay. Well, that included your hand. Yeah, I see yep. you have your hand up. Yep. Yep. Okay. Oh, Is it right. the case, Matt, that if we decided today, the only decision we could make would be to ver to, to to be virtual? Well, yeah, I mean, if we did decide today, all we could decide is to, is to commit to virtual, because if we decide to be in person and then, and then events don't allow it, we're going to decide again. So that, so that's, that's, that's a, that's an interesting, that's an interesting uh, way to pose the question, Steve. Thank you for that. So, um, um, Uh, so, so let me let me let me ask this then. And again, looking for show of hands, how many people think that we should plan right now on doing the fall meeting virtually? And if so, please raise your hand. By that you mean virtually only? Yeah, that's correct. Thank you, Tom. You know, it's a heck of a note when I can recognize voices on Teams. How many we got, Dave? I, I, saw, might... ten. I, I saw 10 at the end. That's the last one I saw. Ten. That's what I see as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you, guys. So, Matt, this is Kozak. Yes, sir. Just in case you can't recognize my voice. Oh, I got you. <laughs> um, so I, I just wanted to put out there that, um, it, you know, you were just talking about base uh, MBAA's convention. Um, that is one week past what you guys are planning for FPA. Uh, and just wanted, you know, like somebody already noted, um, that's going live. They have made that decision already that that is going to be a live event. Um, and considering how much uh, it costs to insure these events, especially now in the post-COVID era where they aren't allowing insurance for that, or it's even more expensive than it was previously for a conference of that size, um, it would appear that our leadership is fairly um, confident that that is going to go forward. 
Uh, I think we have something like 90% of our exhibitors have already signed on for space. Um, just to give you an idea of what the industry, or at least the, 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 the business aviation industry, is looking at for that almost identical time period. So we're, we're talking about one week later. Um, my, my personal thought, um, and you know, I'll throw this out there for, for everybody else, would be that I think we've got a little while to make that decision. A couple of people just noted in the comments that we could tell them as late as uh, September 1st for, for one of them. Um, I, I was thinking that if we just got through the month of May and into June, uh, we could make a legitimate decision by July 1st and we should be able to capture everybody uh, who needs to be there. Um, if, if I'm speaking out of turn or I'm putting words in other people's mouths, please, you know, please let me know. But, uh, I, I think that's a worthwhile, um, time to a discuss what we want to do for the fall meeting. And then if we can do that, um, and, and make that decision by the end of June. And then if we have to shuffle things around to go virtual um, instead, I think we could do that as well. And we'd still have three full months to uh, to make things work. So that's that's my piece. John said exactly what was in my brain, which which could be dangerous, John, but I, I would totally concur with that line of thinking. Um, so so uh, um, in in my in my participants window, um, I don't know if Bob uh, Avgen and Tom Ryan had their hands up because they want to talk or because they had voted from the previous one. So um, that's uh, a vote. That's the vote. OK, very well. Thank you, Bob. I lost track. <laughs> so, Matt, one other question. Um, you have in person plus virtual. Uh, it sounds like that would provide enough flexibility that we could make a fairly late decision um, if MITRE is planning to provide the opportunity to engage remotely um, for people who maybe can't make it because of you know organizational policies or other reasons, as long as MITRE is uh, open to hosting. Is that, am I reading that correctly? Uh, well, y yes. Um... But it's even it's even broader than than that, and 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 that is that I believe we are now having done this for um, eighteen months, basically, totally virtually. I I believe we are at the point where we are almost obliged to continue making the virtual access available to people, even when we go back in person. All right, so we almost don't have to make a decision at all in that. Um, we only need to let people know if, if the MITRE door is going to be open. That could be a very late notice potentially. Uh, well, well, not quite. There's a there's a fly in that in that ointment thinking, and and I, I I'll get to that here in a second. But but yes, Steve, you're 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 you are you are more or less correct with one exception. And and um, again, let me let me get to that here in, in just a little bit. OK, I'm going to I'm going to right now um, make a decision to uh, to to not make the decision to go virtual in October, but to stay in person in October with the idea that we can make a, a later choice if we need to within reason. And and John Kosak, thank you for the information about base that really I, I, I frankly I, I didn't know what what the what I was going to do, but but there's a hell of a lot more money and resources tied up in that than there is in the FPA meeting. And if they're convinced they can do an in-person base one week later, then then I think that the odds of us being able to do one in person, maybe it may be limited in person. It may be socially distanced in person, but we have a several hundred person auditorium that we can probably fit 40 or 50 people in. And and still have the the, the virtual access also. So um, so I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna make the decision now that we're gonna continue planning to be in person with with virtual access available. The location will be uh, the Mitre campus in McLean, Virginia, 
uh, on the 5th through 7th of October for our fall meeting. Um, the spring meeting, we do not have any dates penciled in at this point one year from now. Um, Matthias and I, believe it or not, do look at other conferences and attempt to um, avoid them wherever possible. We do look at when the Cherry Blossom Festival is going to be since we typically meet, have met in, in the spring in Washington, D.C., and we attempt to avoid that. Uh, so um, so I, I, don't, I don't know when it's going to be, nor can I say with complete certainty that it will be in Washington, D.C. in the spring, but this certainly has been our M.O. for the last um, many number of years um, I, I is and, and let me hang on one second. My Microsoft Teams has some very curious um, <laughs> characteristics. I don't see Don Ike on the call, um, so, so I, I would have asked him straight up if he was. But but typically, uh, you know, Don offers the the NTSB. Uh, conference center uh, for FPAW's use, and and um, I guess we have not been, we've been pretty good um, tenants uh, of of that space because uh, he he hasn't told us no yet. But one thing I will throw out to the group uh, as a problem is that th there are not any native teleconferencing capabilities, at least that I'm aware of, in the NTSB conference room. And and while while it can be arranged, it, it is arranged at a at a cost. And so um, we would have to dip into uh, FPAW's budget. Oh, wait a minute. We don't have any money. Uh, so so that that's an issue for us. And, and we would have to try to figure out a way around that if we were going to if we we're going to have it at NTSB in the spring and still keep um, a, a virtual um, uh, connectivity alive. Um, so I'll stop there. Any questions or comments about that? And Tom George, I'm looking at your at your name on here in the conversation that you and I and Jim McClay had the other day. Yeah, nothing to it's, add at the, at the moment. Yeah. <clears throat> this could be a nit, but if we do go in person in the fall, which of the two days would be the in-person just again for kind of, I mean, even though we're going to block three in our calendars for a virtual, just in case. But is there, has that been decided, or is that? You're 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 a step ahead of me, but uh, so 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 bear with me. I'll get there. I promise. John Kosak, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So a couple of comments rolling into the uh, the chat. Um, Andy McClure brought up an interesting thing. He said uh, having involved in coordinating some meetings, decision might be a good idea by July 1st because good spaces are taken, hotels and flights are more complicated. Um, so, and, and I think that's a legitimate point as well. Um, Mark Fanouf, uh can offer up the Alpha Conference Center in Tyson's Corner. And uh, Bob, um, Maybe we should coordinate early with Jim Kuchar and Tom Reynolds at MIT Lincoln Labs to deconflict possible conflict uh, with their workshop. So, um, just some notes coming in for you. Yeah, good, cool, thank you. Uh, I appreciate that, John. And and yeah, yeah. All I can say is that uh, is that we had our date in first, but we we don't we don't advertise well enough for them to know what our date was. I think, and so they. They they scheduled they being the the Lincoln folks scheduled on top of us but we'll we'll uh, we'll we'll keep track of that uh, next time around good point Bob keep me honest on that okay to Dave's comment and and why I said hang on there a minute in general when we meet in person we do two full days with uh, the way we had been doing it pre pandemic is that the first half day the the first half of the first day was when we held this planning meeting. And then the second half of the first day and all of the second day were the actual FPAW plenary meeting. Uh, uh, since we've gone virtual, we've been doing it in three half-ish days, four to five hour days, um, scheduled in such a way that, that um, we don't make Andy get up in the middle of the night there in the Kenai Peninsula and, and don't run past 5 p.m. Eastern. Um, and also don't do more than four to five hours on a telecom because after that you become brain crazy. 
Um, and, and while we've been doing these virtually, and frankly, even when we were doing in-person meetings, um, we, we typically did a primary topic per half day. If it took up the entire half day, so be it. If it did not, we would have one shorter topic or update um, uh, to present. Since we've gone virtual, we've been, we've been sticking to a primary three-ish hour topic and then a shorter one hour topic with, in theory, ample time for discussion and breaks, although we, we, we break our own rules in that area all the time, so don't, don't hold us to that. Um, and um, and we, we have been doing an update the last couple of FPAWs that Tom Ryan has led. Thank you for that, Tom. And, and, and I think that's been good to both, both to kind of maintain that continuity between meetings as opposed to it being a, you know, a, a clean reset at every meeting. And also in those cases where there is, where there is you know, e either some finding or some issue that that we've been wanting to 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 shine a light on it allows us to to continue to shine that light and 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 I, I like that and would probably propose even when we go to in person you know having some kind of an update session somewhere in one of the in one of the kind of three primary half day blocks of time that we use and just in case you had forgotten, there's the, the link to the website, which is how we do all of our um, emailing and communication uh, um, to, to you all. Um, and now, Dave, I still haven't answered your question. So um, let, let, let me bear, bear with me a second and I, I, I will answer. Actually, I'm going to skip this for the moment and I'm going to answer Dave's question. So um, if memory serves me correctly, um, Dave Chorney um, and other and Bruce Carmichael and and several other folks, literally now going on two years ago, suggested that that we needed to have a a a federal agency wide aviation weather review, or as it's as it's being called here on this slide, I have up a, a technical exchange meeting where basically all of the federal agencies that have a role to play in the aviation weather ecosystem get a chance to talk about what they are working on, who they are engaged with, what sorts of, of um, you know, projects and research that, that they are doing. And the, the thought process here was that um, that that we by by it, it actually originated with with Bill Bauman's this is weather across the FAA chart or or several people Bill point to that chart as where they where they came up with this idea I guess Bill has, has dropped and and um, and you know it it shows that not only is weather in where you would think it would be in the aviation weather um, uh, group that 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 bill manages in ANGC 6 and in some of the operational areas within the ATO but it it actually its tentacles are across the agency and and many many people are working on them across the agency and frankly that was why the weather COI was reconstituted was to get to, to get some to, to get to get get our arms our FAA arms around where weather is within the agency and and there's a similar thought that says that you know what it would be good for everybody to know in the aviation or weather arena what what the national weather service is working on and what NOAA is working on and what what the air force is working on and what the navy is working on and 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 so on and so forth so uh, NASA. And so, so this this notion gained a lot of traction to the point that we had, um, if if again, if I remember this correctly, we we planned to do this at the spring 2019 plenary. No, I lie. Spring 2020 plenary meeting. So three meetings ago, and and COVID happened, and. Um, uh, again, if I have the timing of this right, uh, th then we 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 scrubbed at that point. Have been virtual ever since, and 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 have strung this meeting, this notion along, because there was a strong sentiment expressed by the organizers that that 
Um, key benefits from this meeting are, are going to be associated with the kind of in-person um, exchanges of information and hallway meetings and going out to dinner afterwards that, that you can't do at a virtual. Um, and so, so the thought process here, therefore, is that if we have our fall FPA plenary meeting in person in my, at MITRE McLean in October, this will be the basically the, the content of the fall meeting. And I have up on the screen, uh, Randy resubmitted because you can never submit <laughs> topics too frequently. He, he basically submitted a, a, a two sentence description of, of, um, of you know, what this would be about. And, and I can tell you for the folks on the call that in fact, Randy has been meeting monthly with a group of people from all the agencies that I mentioned doing planning for this meeting. So, so unlike the way we usually do things, which is we get through with one meeting, we take about a three or four week break and then we start planning for the next meeting. Th this meeting has been in the planning phase for six months already at least. So let me let me stop there. Let me shut up and ask Randy if if he maybe could could um, could share a little bit more information with the with the group and then um, and then and then I think this will answer your question, Dave, and and also why I really don't want to make the virtual decision quite yet. Randy, over to you. All right, thanks, Matt. Um, I was thinking about sharing my screen of, of what I have, but I can just read it. I don't think there's really a need to uh, to do that. But uh, as as Matt said, um, we've been getting together for, uh, basically the last uh, four months or so at least um, for an hour or so, just kind of talking about you know what this meeting would even look like, uh, what the topics would be, um, who to invite. Um, type things. Um, you know, it, <clears throat> when you start looking at it, um, there's a whole bunch of groups and agencies out there that um, either directly or indirectly support either research or operations. Um, and, and then when you start to include UAS, it opens it up even more. And, you know, then there's some that, uh, some agencies out there that um, do research and and operations support that you know their findings also impact aviation and you know a perfectly good one is uh, you know the wind energy uh, folks um, they're looking at you know they're collecting information in the in the PBL you know right where we're doing the low level operations for UAS and and everything else and. Um, you know, maybe those direct observations don't apply, but maybe the techniques that they use um, might apply for uh, for some of our things. So, um, you know, we started looking at it, and and the goals were you know, obviously awareness and education of of current and planned efforts, um, identifying areas for collaboration and gaps, uh, informing industry and academia of needs and opportunities because obviously the the federal government doesn't do a lot of direct research. Um, we uh, we fund that research, and so our our industry partners definitely have to be involved. Um, and then just you know brainstorming the plans for that future collaboration and and seeing what's out there. Um, so we came up with basically, like I said, three could certainly be full days and and when we looked at it we figured out we could probably do three full weeks of this but we're gonna have to pare it down some um so we came up with uh you know maybe day one would be just you know traditional and and high altitude aviation and uh things so it would be uh you know maybe an overview of of the aviation weather from the weather service and and the faa and talking about uh, current status and programs and uh, and things um You know, looking at uh, you know other groups, you know, like I said, FAA, uh, AWC, NASA, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Global Science Labs, the CWSU's Command Center, um, the AWU. You know, there's there's a lot of groups out there. That's just on the on the 
more of the commercial aviation side, and then you've got the uh, uh, the DOD side with the Air Force and Navy, uh, Coast Guard, even, even Homeland Security. Um, so you've got all these all these different groups out there um, that, uh, that that we could bring in and 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 have talk. And and one thing we don't want to do is obviously you know death by PowerPoint. We don't want uh, each group going up there and talking half an hour about what they do because after you know by that afternoon people are sticking pins in their eyes and things like that. So we're looking at maybe you know, more of a panel session and and. Uh, open discussions and things like that. Things we still need to open up uh, or or discuss. Uh, day two would be more of a multi-use weather, um, and we can talk about the future aviation division or or vision or you know that 2035 vision. Um, and what are the other visions for the other agencies in the context of uh, aviation weather information? Um, I know I believe NASA has a a 2045 uh, outlook. Um, you know, what are the DOD um, and others doing? And uh, and then the last one was uh, maybe day three, doing more of the emerging aviation and local weather, which would certainly be the UAS, UAM uh, uh, contingent. And, uh, you know, talking about, uh, uh, you know, the inputs for those uh, uh, current programs and questions on opportunities and things. And there's other potential topics. Uh, and actually on the UAS one, uh, Nancy Madonka has done a very good job of coming up with some ideas that uh, uh, really lay it out nicely for that uh, for that day. You know, we, we don't even get into uh, things like economic models, uh, the roles of, uh, of the federal weather agencies. Um, we don't talk a lot about operational weather, but certainly that's a that's a big piece. Um, getting information to decision makers. Um, you know, th there's just a ton of things out there that we can certainly discuss and and talk about. So there's a lot of work to be done. Um, I think it could be done in in the six months or five months now that that we'd have. But uh, um, I. A as we talked about, I think it would be much better as a as an in person. Um, workshop or, or Tim um, just for the fact that you know these a lot of these agencies we don't have a lot of contact with so it'd be nice to meet them in person and you know talk with them and get to know them as opposed to um, a, as nice as zoom is it's it's rather in, uh, impersonal unfortunately so I'll stop there because I'm tired That, thank you, Randy, and, and that was great. Um, um, th there are several folks on the call, I believe, who um, have been um, at, at least peripherally, if not directly involved in uh, in your monthly meetings. I do see Nancy Mendonca is on the line. I see Ralph Stoffler's on the line. Um, e either uh, Nancy or Ralph, any any comments, any uh, any um clarifications or amplifications you want to make to what Randy just said? Other than I, th I think folks have a definite interest in one domain of weather. So the grouping of it was to try and if folks were only interested in, you know, transport class aircraft weather, that they could come for the first day and a half. But if they were really interested in AAM, they would come for, you know, the sec half of the second day and the third was kind of the th some of the thinking behind the agenda. Great, thanks, Nancy. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, you know, we're trying to spread it out so that uh, you know, if you had a definite interest one day, you didn't have to come to all three, but you know, others might want all three. So. Hey, this is Don. How you guys doing? Good, Don. So, Matt, uh, the only comment I would have is again, um, I think it would be good if. There was a, you know, a lot of the focus is on, you know, how can we also use government programs for development and licensing of capabilities uh, later to commercial sector to then go out and run with with some of those capabilities and get them out there and and really, uh, you know, open up the innovation and, and allow private sector to fill in gaps. You know, NASA has a really nice 
programs for uh, like for the UTM, the Unmanned Aerial Systems Technology Management Service. They built a UTM framework, licensed, and they're licensing it out now to companies, right? And companies are running with it. Um, when I think of uh, the National Weather Service, uh, I think of faucets, right? Facets and the uh, severe weather uh, AI tools or tools they're building that, you know, we're going to be having a meeting. Uh, uh, I'm going to be running a panel panel on the American Meteorological Society uh, summer workshop on talking about how government agencies can look at how in these development efforts where they're spending taxpayer money, how could they also uh, allow for those capabilities to be licensed by the private sector uh, for, for use. So I think, you know, what I like to see in this discussion is also more of a conversation about R2 commercial operations using government resources that are being used so that we can enable the private sector to go out and fill the gaps that the government's not going to be able to fill in, in, in a lot of these areas effectively or soon enough. And I think having conversations around also the research topics that people are focusing on, you know, it would be good if the private sector can have some time to talk about what we see as really the primary research needs to based on what we're seeing in the industry because we have a lot of boots on the ground and we're getting a lot of information uh, about what's required um and I, I think that there's a lot of redundancy even uh you know i think the government is investing in stuff that the private sector is developing already right uh like for instance i heard that there is a an app being built by the faa for small drone pilots well that's you know, that's really not necessary. That's competing with the private sector. And it's money that could be put into other harder problems that we need the private sector and aviation to focus on, like maybe helping us uh, with setting up a, a mechanism for validating, calibrating, you know, data performance uh, and, and having a way to certify uh, data performance and enforce that, things like that. So I think we need to have a conversation also that gives some feedback back into the industry and how we can look at maybe looking at how we've been operating and see how we can maybe be more innovative and and help open the uh, the funnel a little bit more. That's my input. Okay, okay so uh, this is Ralph Stoffler here. If you don't mind, I, I got a couple of things I'm going to add on to uh, what John just rattled off. I, um, you know, I'll be honest with you, the more I get into this business, there is a lot of things going on uh, from a variety of different, uh, you know, both in the commercial sector and, and the government sector. And to have a meeting where we all get together and kind of outline all of the different things that are happening would be a very, very good. Uh, so I think that's a great plan. The thing that we also need to roll into here, and I know people don't like to talk about policy regulations and all that, but we're increasingly experiencing that there's lots of technology out there. But the question is, if the current policies uh, don't allow the use of certain technology then there's a reluctance on the on the part of industry uh, to invest in those areas. So it, it would be a good thing to talk about. Here's all the stuff that's currently happening throughout industry and the government. Here's the current policies and what we're thinking about where we're going. I, I think that would be great. And the last thing that nobody likes to talk about is the issue of metrics and evaluation. One of the big problems with um, with uh, the UAS industry in particular, there's lots and lots of companies out there that are providing services, but the question is how good are they? How should they be evaluated? How are we forthcoming? Um, I, I know that on the civilian on the on the civilian side and on the military side, we're obligated to provide a lot of metrics. Uh, most of the, the uh, private industry doesn't provide metrics. And even the metrics that we provide on the government side aren't particularly useful to, to aviation. You know, I don't think most of you probably care about what the 500 millibar anomaly assessment is. So, <laughs> you know, what I'd like to see is here's all the technical stuff that's going on. Here's how policy is changing to utilize uh, those technical innovations. And finally, how do we evaluate uh, on whether these things are actually allowing uh, the mission to go forth? And I would add on the evaluation side, how could the government develop tools that can be made available to the private sector weather companies that want to participate in the aviation industry to validate data? In other words, you know, these are things that the private sector has trouble investing in is 
is building software that can help them build these evaluations. And, you know, what we want to do is unleash innovation, right? And the way to do that is by, uh, you know, taking care of things that are something that the private sector doesn't like to invest a lot in because it doesn't make them money, but gives them the tools they need to help meet those requirements. And I would go back and say that, um, you know, we need some kind of a certification validation capability for data performance standards. And, you know, I think that's where the government needs to focus on helping us figure out how to do that and to reduce the bar to entry. You know, I don't, the answer isn't, well, send your send all your packages into AFS 200 and they'll evaluate it and then we'll send it to the weather service and see how good you are. Because it's first of all, it's not a it's not a consistent process. It's not something that I feel comfortable with because I I'm not sure that the people who are looking at it even know what they understand what we're, you know what what they're seeing. And we need to build a better system to make it simpler for what for OEMs and operators to find a weather source without having to go through certification themselves and certifying the weather providers and all that. These are things that, you know, I think we should be as a community talking about because we can then really advance and forward our capabilities holistically and really help move the industry forward. So um, thanks for that for me and Ralph giving us a chance to talk about that. Appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. And, and I, I, as you, as you guys were talking, I was, I was thinking, you know, Everything you say is important. What what I don't know is precisely how it integrates with the the intentions for the the, the fall meeting that have already been put on paper. But but Randy's you know Randy's listening to it all. Nancy's listening to I'm listening to it. So you know if if there is an appropriate way to do that, and to me it feels like that's the dialogue portion that. Randy said, "You know, we don't want to be deaf by PowerPoint. Uh, that's the that that's the roundtable portion where 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 we do have the the exchange between the uh, the the presenters or the experts and 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 the folks in the audience. And and um, you know, I, I don't know. Maybe we won't solve it. Maybe maybe we won't fix it at this at, at this three day tem. But but you know, maybe we we elevate it to the point." That 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 there's movement in that area. Randy, did I, did I see you uh, unleash your phone? <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah, you know, I, I was taking notes, um, and uh, and especially the, you know, both that, uh, you know, the licensing slash transition. I, I guess I could call it um, topic as well as policy. Um, th those could be three days right there. <laughs> um, and, and that's the, and, you know, and that's the whole problem with this. There's so much that we can, we can talk about and discuss that, uh, uh, you know, we we really have to do. We'll have to narrow this down some. And, uh, um, but yeah, I, I I certainly think that, you know, we we do need to at least carve out some time for industry to uh, to talk as well because, um, if. You know that's that's just as important as the as the government side. I I think even though this is a government, you know, agency, Tim. Yeah. So here's the thing, Matt. I don't think we have to solve it in this next meeting. I'm not. You know, I think you know I become you know uncharacteristically patient uh, because I understand the way things work. Since but if when? we if there's just an acknowledgement, <laughs> yeah. I, know. It, I mean, you, Randy, you've known me for years. You know, I've gotten much more mellow. But here's the thing is that um, we just, you know, I just want to hear acknowledgement that, yeah, these are things that, you know, we need to take on because, you know, I, I don't want to go meeting to meeting with kind of the same. I mean, we had a good meeting this time. We had a good UAS session, right? And I think that's really good progress. I don't want to dismiss the progress that's been made. I mean, I've really been really excited about uh, Gordy and his presentation, right? But, you know, what I don't want to see happen is we have these, these really good moments and then we fall back into our tire tracks again and start driving in them uh you know we really need now if this is if this is all set up already for october that's fine right i think the key is is to think about the next meeting then or how this meeting could set up the next meeting right or you know let's look at it as um as a series of of dialogue that doesn't have to be all solved in this in this round so to speak i i i 
I agree with what you with with almost everything you said, Don. The the, the mellow part, I'm I'm still I'm I'm processing that. Let me unpack that a little bit here. <laughs> so relative. <laughs> you know, I, I, you know, the original intent of this, or at least my original intent, maybe maybe I uh, kind of got off track, but you know, my thought was to try to get try to find out what other agencies are doing and get our arms around this because I know from a research standpoint, um, you know, trying to to plan our research and making sure that we don't. Um, you know, do things that that have already been done by others. Um, that is a hard nut to crack because I don't know who's doing what out there. Um, we have a we have a better relationship with NASA now than than we've had in the past. So I'm starting to see what uh, what things they're doing, and obviously the you know the Weather Service does some things. But there's a lot of groups out there that I just have no clue what they are doing. And so that was kind of my thinking was maybe getting everybody together to uh, to see what they're doing and then go from there. So that was that was kind of my intent on on this. But you're right. We're not going to we're not going to solve everything in three days. Um, it'd probably be three years or more before we can you know, solve some of these things. But um, but the questions you bring up are, are certainly valid and and um, at least need to be brought up in in any kind of uh, uh, Tim type setting. I mean, how does this set up? The you know, don't get off track on what you've planned. Um, I think it is a good idea to take inventory. I'm looking forward to hearing it and understanding it myself. I know Ralph. I know anybody in the private sector is interested in knowing what everybody's doing, right? And I think that that's not a bad thing. So I'm just saying, though, let's let's have like a, a process here where we go to the next step after that, that it's tied together like a series and not just a one off, you know, thing. I mean, it'd be nice if we can, you know, help establish more inputs to the research agendas that are focused on other things that we just talked about. Right. Uh, not just on the science, but also, you know, on the policy, on the, you know, on the use of innovation for R2O, commercialization of software, you know, all those things that could help, you know, really move the industry forward. Yep. Yeah, and uh, Steve uh, Dyer had his hand up first, and then Tom George has his hand up right behind Steve. Thanks, Matt. Um, <clears throat> I think this was brought up previously, not in today's meeting, but in maybe three or four meetings ago, uh, was the idea that uh, maybe this uh, tech uh, exchange meeting is a is a special meeting of FPAW, which adds a meeting in any given year, um, you know, so that it's a separate meeting. Uh, I think what I'm hearing, and, and, and maybe it's, uh, you know, uh, audio bias on my part, but um, I think what I'm hearing is is not that people don't want this, um, but that they don't want to lose uh, you know, you, what we've been uh, making progress on uh, with the the general FPAW uh, approach of multiple topics uh, over multiple days. So um, I don't know if we turn the fall FPAW into a five day meeting or we uh, we find a you know three days for this and and a day and a half for uh, the usual, but uh, I'm thinking maybe that is part of the answer. And I think that's part of what was discussed when this first came up. Yeah, I I I wish I could re I wish I could re I wish I could recall that that is exactly what happened. But uh, you know, you mentioned biases. I. I think I'm biased to answer that in my mind it was it was going to be one of our FPA meetings, but it was going to be a you know a a uh, an extraordinary FPA meeting. But I but I hear you, and and frankly was even while sighing mentally was was thinking similar thoughts. Uh, Steve, Tom, go ahead. Um, yeah, and this. I guess as I'm listening to this, uh, A, I want it all, of course, but <laughs> um, I'm also worried that if if we devote an entire three-day meeting to 
even though broad, a single topic, there's the risk that people that don't think they're interested in that topic won't participate at all. But I guess the broader picture, it seems to me, is we are starting to talk about and perhaps frame several high-level issues, and and I don't think any of them are going to be uh, addressed and checked off the list by a single meeting. So, um, and I also think, yeah, there is some need from some continuity to to other topics that have been discussed, but maybe not devote the whole meeting to them, like PIREPS. So I guess I'm wondering if spending some time actually framing a number of high-level issues or topics, and and then figuring out how can we put some of a you know still make a one of them or another of them a dominant theme for a meeting, but but start to build a little bit of structure that will allow us a smoother continuity going into the future. End of thought. Okay. Uh, Gary Picodner. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. Yeah. This was just a quick question with this topic that um, was jogging my memory, and I don't remember exactly where it went. When this came up, wasn't there somebody at FPA that writes a report that does this who is also going to help champion this? And then COVID hit. I thought we had some guy who takes like inputs from all these agencies and sort of does this as his job, and he was going to try to help put something like this together. I don't remember the guy or the department. Yeah. What so happened that, to him and his yeah, involvement? Yeah. So, uh, so that's a that's an interesting story all by itself. That was Dave Chorney. I, I don't, I didn't see Dave on the line, but I've not been paying great. I, I don't think he's on the line. From the office of the Federal Coordinator of Meteorology or OSCM, yeah. who uh, who was you know he's not an FPOP person, but he was an OSCM person, whose uh, whose function among other things is to uh, to, to coordinate these sorts of things. And in fact, uh, he uh, the, the first go we had at this meeting, uh, he was the the point person and and was was helping uh, to coordinate it. Subsequently, um, you know, that first meeting was OBE uh, or OBP in the case of pandemic, I guess. And and um, and uh, Randy has stepped up into that that role and is basically doing what Dave was doing and the office of the federal coordinator of meteorology as many of you know is itself currently in a transition phase into uh, something called ICAMS and Bill Bauman help me out here I forget what that stands for now the uh, um, well it's 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 a it's a it's an OFCM on steroids kind of notion i suppose but there's a there's a new organization that is being that is that is um, reports to the uh, office of science and technology policy at the at the presidential level and and uh, it's it's taking OFCM's place and it's in a bit of flux right now so it's clear to me that at this point in time that that we're going to have to do this on our own, meaning that, that Randy, unfortunately for him, is still probably saddled with this going forward. Interagency Council for Meteorological Services. How about Thank that? You. Thank you, sir. <laughs> and we did have, uh, uh, I can't remember the person's name. We did have an ICAMS person attend one of our meetings. Yeah, that was Martine, I think. Martine, uh, it was. Yes, yeah. it was Martine. So. Yeah. Martine is the deputy director for um, uh, I forget the the name or the acronym. They're the, the logistics support for ICAMS uh, out of NOAA. Right. Yeah. IMCO. That's what that is. Yeah. So Matt, what's IMCO stand for? <laughs> uh, I, I I don't know. I am company. Yes. I, yes. I don't know. <laughs> you you made me look up iCams. And, and and also remember well, we're we're just trying to do kind of an aviation specific, not a weather specific. Right. Right. So so we, we were we were kind of skinny down from what OFCM itself or iCams itself is looking at. They're looking at a, a much bigger picture and we're we've got aviation squarely in mind with what we're looking at. So that, that is a true statement. Yep. Um so so let me let me uh 
we've been going for an hour and and five minutes. L let me uh, l let me kind of do a summary here of what I think I have heard, and then then let's take a short break and allow me to refill my coffee cup. Um, so so the 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 intent of the fall. 2021 FPAW meeting has been and continues to be to hold a three-day in-person federal agency aviation weather review or technical exchange meeting subject to some amount of change based on not only the discussion today but uh, the discussion that we will undoubtedly have um, in the in the coming months. Therefore, the planning meeting that we are attending today, other than the, the really good um, input and feedback that has been generated already uh, from, from folks, the intent of today's planning meeting is not to plan for this, for this coming fall, but actually to plan for the next spring meeting in 2022. So that's, that's point one that, that I, I, wanna, I want people to kind of get their heads around. Uh, and and Tom George talked about you know putting structure around this and uh, the the slide that I skipped by by very very uh, quickly has a list of general topics that we have either um, uh, you know had in previous FPAW meetings or or had as um, as important for us to consider and 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 take a look at and and. Um, you know, we can use that as as at least partially the the basis of that. But in addition to that, we have gotten a bunch of newly submitted topics over the last couple of weeks, frankly, since the FPAW meeting, um, um, some of which at least touch on uh, the the things that were mentioned earlier uh, in, in our conversation here today. So so. Um, after we take a five minute or so break and come back at quarter past 12, what I want to do is to transition into talking about the planning for, for the spring meeting and maybe springboard off of a little bit of what Tom has, George has has suggested would be you know a, a way of looking at this and some of the input that that Don and Ralph and others have given us about gee, this is where we really need to to look and get some help in 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 our particular area here and and see if that turns into a, a a robust spring meeting with the caveat that whatever planning we do for the spring meeting if if society goes to heck in a handbasket between now and then and our fall meeting is forced to be virtual that spring meeting will become our fall meeting so before you volunteer for anything understand that that's 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 something that we have to consider and and that we may in for instance July be saying well it's not going to happen we're going to go virtual we're going to swap the the spring and fall um agendas or 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 meetings and and you spring people We've now just accelerated you by six months. Let's go. And so, so that that's what I want you to be thinking about. Everybody, take five minutes and come on back at quarter past twelve Eastern time. So uh, it's quarter past. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, those of you who have returned, um, uh, John just uh, just asked a very good question, and and I can see that you know in in typical typical Matt fashion. Um, um, you know, sometimes I can't see the forest for the trees, and and um, um, I I have been assuming all along that through this and last hour's conversation that everybody understands that the fall 2021 FPA meeting at this point is intended to be a three-day federal aviation weather agency review slash. Tim. So it's a it's a different format. It's a different um, you know number of days. Normally we do two. This would be a three day in person um, plus 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 being simultaneously transmitted virtually, um, and and that is intended to be the fall FPAW meeting. Although uh, isn't it interesting that that you know there's been at least an expression of 
gee, we'd like to we'd like to keep our FPAW meetings the way they are and do this as an extraordinary meeting, perhaps in between or something like that. So um, so very interesting to me. Um, th that being said, then the planning that we are are going to do in the coming uh, little bit of time here is for the spring of 2022 FPAW meeting with the understanding that depending on how uh, the situation, the in-person situation evolves in the fall, if, if, we, if we conclude that we're not going to be able to be in person in the fall, then, then the, the intent would be to move that spring meeting agenda into the fall meeting slot day-wise and do it virtually from 11 to to three or four uh, Eastern, as we have done the last uh, last three F pause. Um, so let me let me see where we are. D do I a question to the group? Just looking for feedback. Do, do do we need to go over this list of general topics? Okay. So here are the list of general topics that F <laughs> sessions have generally can be categorized under. With that having been said, we heard from this morning's conversation, there's a, a lot of interest in some areas that maybe aren't explicitly stated in here, such as the standards and policy area. Um, so uh, so I, I think if, if, uh, if you guys and gals are okay with this, I'm just gonna head straight into the newly submitted topics. And 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 talk to them and invite any of the folks who submitted um, these these topics to to add or augment or correct me if I if I mess it up. So there were two um, suggestions submitted to the FPA website for um, a session about uh, low altitude weather. Um, research, I would say. In other words, um, uh, what, what, well, in part, what is, what is being done, you know, who, who would be willing to present stuff that they are working on in this planetary boundary layer area as far as, as far as making forecasts in there, as far as filling out the, the, uh, the, the significant lack of information that exists in this area for the for the, the new entrant uh, operators, the UASs and UAMs. Um, and, and then, um, uh, so, so you can read here uh, what uh, Marilyn Pearson and Claudia McKnight uh, submitted. Marilyn, I see you're on the call. Um, and uh, so if you'd like to amplify the <laughs> what I tried to describe here, I'd appreciate it. Thanks, Matt. Um, hi, everyone. I'm not sure I can uh, add anything, but we've been talking for years about UAS and thinking specifically, I guess, about the 55 and below, or in some cases above 55 pounds, but uh, it's expanded into the advanced air mobility and the EV toll market, simplified vehicle operations, these operations are intended to be commercial with cargo and or passengers with pilots initially, and in some cases, fully autonomous. Um, the OEMs are anticipating piloted to remotely to autonomous in most cases. So if there are vertiports on the top of buildings in, in cities, and the intent is to go from those buildings to the local airport, uh, something like that, then what what are the impacts of weather, especially if that's an autonomous vehicle? Um, so my suggestion was to expand the discussion and maybe the ASTM F38 group, Don, uh, to include larger than the small UAS and consider EV toll operations as well. Okay. And I believe yours was the first of those two, correct, Marilyn? That, that, that I'm showing on the screen right now, and I believe Claudia's was the uh, was the second one. And and uh, Claudia, in her, uh, if I have that right, in her 
comment does talk about uh, the, the the need for standards, which goes back to some of the some of the uh, uh, commentary that both Don and and uh, and, and Ralph made uh, earlier today. Any uh, any anything from uh, from anybody else about this particular topic area? Well, I can I can tell you that uh, without giving you a commercial, certainly uh, my company is working on capabilities that will significantly help in these areas. So this is uh, this is to a great extent what low level IASA radars are all about, where you have the ability to track weather. Uh, the appropriate UAS and all activities that are in the uh, in the airspace in that boundary layer. So uh, this is a big deal for us, and uh, you know uh, we've been more than happy to present on what we're doing in this area. Okay, very good. Thank thank you, Ralph. Dan, uh, off of this spring uh, FPA meeting, there was actually a subgroup of uh, that uh, uh, I guess a birds of a feather, a very initial construct of utilizing uh, the uh, UAV UAS for, uh, no, no, for uh, sensing uh, at this low, uh, sensing this low altitude weather. So we might be able to have some subsection be a report back from that um, birds of a feather group. And I, I did see that conversation uh, going on, uh, uh, Dan, when uh, when it was taking place in the meeting or at the, the tail end of the meeting. And I, I thought that was very, very interesting to, uh, you know, to, to, to see that transpire. And I, I need to probably get with you offline and, and have a conversation um, with you about some some um, some other work that's going on. It's, it's very similar to what you're talking about right now. Don, you you got to be mellow now, but but you're up next. No, uh, nice job uh, on this uh, statement, Marilyn. Really, and Claudia, I really, I think you did a really good job on it, and I'm it, it's great. So I just all the comment I'll make is, we just got to be careful about uh, trying to expand the ASTM F38 too fast because right now we still haven't addressed some of the basic tackling, balking and tackling issues that we've got to get through. Um, Ralph's been working on some of them. And, you know, my, our goal right now is to just try to get something out for, um, you know, drone operations below 400 feet so we can get something. And then once we have that, and once we see how everything's evolving with the research and other things, then we can start moving into the other areas that you you address, we definitely want to get there. I'm just you know I'm just managing expectations. Um, I've been working with East EASA and uh, trying to bring them along. I'm actually learning a lot working with the Europeans that I'm going to be bringing back into the STM group. Uh, but um, I just want to manage expectations. But this is really good. Thank you, Don. Janet Ford, my favorite session lead of all time. You have your hand up. Yes. Good morning. Well, actually, good afternoon. Um, I just had one other comment, um, and Marilyn and I have talked about this, and that has to do with um, the training and then the ability um, to understand and then interpolate any weather information that's going to be provided to non-aviation uh, weather users. So providing the information, um, the low altitude weather, um, even to these um, UAS users, um, is great, but then them having the ability to understand it, especially if they have not been in the aviation field and have not used um, uh, weather products before, understanding what they're reading and understanding that information um, is totally different. So that's another aspect of this as well that would probably need to be at least addressed on a basic level um, if we are going to introduce this um, this subject or topic um, at a meeting. That's just my comment. Thank you, Jan. Hey, it's Justin over at UPS. I've been on here on the phone, but I haven't uh, been super engaged. Uh, I like the last comment there, especially um, because I think there's a couple different buckets or categories of people even within the aviation side. So you, you will have your, your seasoned pilots who fly drones occasionally, and then you'll have your part 107 guys that were probably hobby pilots 
flying for fun and then saw a way to make some money and became commercial as a result. And then you'll have your, uh, what's call it enterprise commercial operators like the UPS or Amazon or Google that do have aviation background and don't need the help with that. So, uh, there's, there's definitely different crowds that need a different approach to teach them what they're looking for. Good comment, Justin. Uh, and I'm glad you've been lurking in the background. Thanks. So, uh, so let, let me just uh, let me just say that that I sense that there is um, a certain amount of interest in, in this area, um, in this topic area, and, um, and and so noted as that for the moment, because we do have we do have some some uh, again some really good uh, suggestions following along here. Any other comments on 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 this topic area? Okay, I'm going to go on to the next one. Um, those of you who attended a couple of weeks ago, the the second session of the first day heard two, for me, very interesting and exceptionally sobering, in the case of at least one of them, presentations uh, uh, organized by Tom Fahey, who uh, is unable to be here uh, with us today, about spec spectrum interference. And there was... Um, there was some expression of interest in basically taking that one hour ish session that we had and and uh, expanding it out into a um, a full three hour session in uh, at, at a coming FPA of of importance potentially. Um, if you all remember in in um, in the the presenter from Collins Aerospace, whose first name is Sai and his last name has more letters than we have in our alphabet, um, he, he said that there is a that there is an FCC decision point coming up. I believe in, if I remember correctly, December or perhaps November. Um, that that will kind of be a um, I my words now a final position uh, taken and and um, uh, you know between now and then if if what Sai mentioned as the 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 danger the potential dangers associated with with some of the uh, 5g spectrum um, interference uh, on radio altimeters comes into being, you know, it, it it sounded to me like like we could be setting up some 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 situations for aircraft um, as far as their radio altimetry is concerned that could lead to 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 an outcome that nobody wants. And and so um, so from that perspective, um, Tom suggested that. Uh, that that we should we should if we're going to do this have this expanded session at the FPA fall meeting and and as he was talking about this uh, especially if we were going to have it in Washington D.C. Uh, he talked about bringing some some heavyweight folks from the U.S. Congress in to both be a keynote speaker and listen to the deliberations. Um, you know, I'm I'm not a lobbyist. Tom is, so uh, so I can't say with any certainty that uh, that you know, Congressman, Senator, so and so, or Congressman such and such, is going to come in and speak. But uh, certainly, the conversation that I had with him suggested that that is how that is what he would want to do if we had a session like that in the fall. Now, the fall session, as currently planned, frankly probably doesn't have either room or a a convenient jumping off point from the the agenda that has been prelim preliminarily put together to to have this session nonetheless um i i throw that out there for you uh to to consider and and perhaps to comment on based i guess on if nothing else on what you heard two weeks ago um, at, at the one hour session that we had. Over.
Either there's no interest or I've lost you. <clears throat> Matt, this is Bruce. I, um, I'm just thinking <clears throat> that perhaps this might be the uh, poster child for uh, this interagency um, collaboration process. But this is clearly uh, interagency um, uh, cross-cutting uh, technology and policy. So it, this this could be uh, uh, a case study in in why we want to do this review session. You know, I, you know, it's funny, Bruce, how the how the human brain is wired. You know, I I think of spectrum issues as as this is not an aviation weather problem, but it certainly is an aviation problem, or or certainly has the potential to be an aviation problem under certain weather conditions. So I guess I guess I guess you could make that claim and and to say that you know our, our goal is to find out what aviation weather stuff the other agencies are working on. I loved Randy's example of the wind energy folks doing research in the PBL and and you know are there is there information they're coming up with or are there techniques they're developing that that would be applicable to you know to the to the the UAS, um, you know, uh, the 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 unmanned airspace or the or the the GA and helicopter emergency management uh, type operations. And and to your point, Bruce, uh, you know, m maybe there's a connection. What I don't want to do is is say to to Randy, Randy, can you shoehorn in three hours of this into your already a full agenda? Well, I was just thinking, you know, this is a lot more than radio altimetry involved here. This. This is involved with a, a lot of weather data uh, that gets moved uh, from point A to point B uh, on these frequencies that may be uh, potential interference uh, frequencies for the movement uh, of weather data. Yeah, yeah, no, you're right. I was focused in on the radio altimetry safety issue, but you're absolutely correct. And, and Jordan Girth's presentation was very clear about that. So, Randy, I'm gonna I'm gonna put you on the spot, but just ask you: Do you see Do you see any way that that this could be fit in? Same uh, with you, Nancy, if you don't mind. Uh, is this Is there a there there? And and uh, I know I talked about it very very preliminarily with Matthias, and and he, he was he had concerns that we'd be trying to slam a square peg into a round hole. Yeah, my my concern here is. If we have a speaker like a you know a congressional member or something speaking, that might be one thing. If we're just rehashing basically what we just heard about you know, two or three weeks ago, you know what's the point? I you know we're we're kind of you know preaching to the choir at this time. We already know that there's interference issues. Um, you know we need to get this out to other groups. Um, yeah, if if those other groups or other federal agencies that don't know about this, fine. But I suspect they do. So I, I don't know. I mean, I'm 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 struggling here to see what the point of this would be that we haven't already done in the past. Good good point. In, in other words, if we're just talking to ourselves once again, then, then there's no point in just talking to ourselves once again. Yep. Yeah. Now, now if we get a you know congressman's ear and say, hey, here's here's what the problems are, you know, besides them just reading, you know, or, or hearing from Tom Fahey what the problem is, maybe that's different. But otherwise, um, I don't know. I I think it could be better time better spent on other topics because you know we've been talking about this for years and nothing's really happening except that. The uh, you know, cellular companies are pushing forward and buying up our bandwidth. And well, <clears throat> so what we say doesn't really matter. So, hmm. Ralph, you got you have a you're you're unmuted. Yeah. So uh, you know, I spent a lot of time working this issue when I was still working for the government. I think we all realize this is a politically charged arena. <laughs> Um, and so, yes, I mean, our spectrum is being sold. Uh, we've been told about it. 
and to a great extent, responsible government agencies are supposed to be migrating out of the impacted spectrum using funds, which they're going to get from the sale of the spectrum. So uh, I'm not sure what we would gain out of this. Uh, my biggest concern is, is that, uh, you know, they're busily spell selling off the spectrum, but we're not moving out of the spectrum fast enough. Uh, and some of the so-called uh, exclusion zones are being impacted considerably. So this is another one of those areas where we're kind of watching by seeing what happens uh, because most of us don't realize direct impact. You know, and you brought up the issue of, well, what does this mean to aviation weather? If, if at the end of the day, uh, you know, government agencies like NOAA, uh, if their model starts to degrade because not enough data is getting into the model because of spectrum conflicts, uh, even though we're not directly related, eventually aviation weather is going to face impacts by these decisions. Dan? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I just need to note that I was the first one to make the uh, uh, the, the snicker there that Congress, uh, Congress members speaking, but FPA has been biased towards productivity. But with that in mind, that I think that actually if we have the ability to give some members the, 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 our agenda of what, what we're going to be speaking towards, it, it might lose some productivity in our meeting with them speaking, but it also might take, it, it might have some benefit of the uh, of uh, becoming a, a thorn in their side that they start feeling that, uh, that they need to do and that they need to do something with it. So I see a positive there. Is that okay? Okay. Don Birchoff. Yeah, I'll just say, you know, at the AMS level, you know, because I'm on the, I run the committees and I'm on some chairs. This is a big issue. And, and I think anything we do should be discussed with um, the folks that are working this at NOAA and at the F and uh, AMS. This is a huge issue. And I, I just think that, you know, we can, you know, we can bring the Congress folks in and do that. And that's all fine and good. Uh, but I know there's a lot of people working it pretty hard and there's a lot of application areas, aviation only being one of them that are going to be impacted by this. So I just, again, just trying to take the big picture view. Are we better off focusing our energies on the people who are fighting it and giving them the uh, ammunition they need uh, regarding how this impacts aviation uh, rather than trying to, you know, trying to fight it ourselves with Congress? Or, I mean, I'm not saying we shouldn't. I'm just oh, just trying to present that bigger picture. Yeah. Yeah, and, I, and I'm sure that if Tom Fahey was here, he would much more eloquently describe what he had in mind when he submitted this um, and, and would relay much more faithfully what, uh, you know, what, what, what he, and I, he and I talked about. Dave? Yes, and I'm sorry, I missed, I, I was just transitioning from phone to computer here and I missed who was just speaking, but to the point that other aspects of aviation are affected with this, as we saw in the presentation at the last AFPA, and as I had a, a heated discussion in a one hour meeting this morning on avionics that I have periodically, uh, th their strength in numbers, and certainly they were excited when I informed them about the impacts of satellite and radar in the aviation weather or in the weather community for spectrum issues uh, such as this with this 5G. Uh, it, it it gave them the ability to be able to leverage also the issues that, that we're having here in aviation weather in their world of the radio altimeters and impacting CAT 2 and CAT 3 approaches, um, you know, if somebody's walking by with a cell phone. So th 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 I think there needs to be um, uh, collaboration or, or at least uh, recognition that there is that broader aspect and uh, so we don't get tunneled into just this aviation weather. Or, or weather rather that uh, uh, is at stake here when we start engaging, um, you know, people at like congressional levels or something. Yeah. Yeah. And to jump on that, you know, um, the folks that are really going to get the attention are the OEMs because they're the ones that are worried about crashing airplanes. And mm -hmm. if we are able to funnel our concerns in and we give them more ammunition uh, and we can make it into a safety case that's going to impact them, that's that. 
generally ha- carries even more weight, you know, with, with folks because the safety card, right? You drop it and that usually gets people's attention. Yep. Yep. The Honeywell is a huge maker of radio altimeters and uh, they've been all over this and uh, we've had a couple of meetings with them. So anyway, just as, as they were not aware when I brought it up a couple of weeks ago and I shared right. the FR presentation with them, which Matt is why I asked you for a copy of it. Um, they were uh, uh, excited to hear that there was a, a other aspects uh, that that uh, would be in lockstep with them on this issue. Yeah, when, when you first presented it, Dave, and, and you said that that they were excited about about this problem, I, I I thought, what does he mean by that? But now I get it. Yeah, yeah, they were, um, yeah, and that's probably not the right adjective. But uh, they were they were they were gratified to know that they were not alone. Mm. So. Okay. And, and, and no more cat two, cat three, or safety implications uh, because of radio altimeter issues. Not to mention the uh, GPWS uh, implications. I mean, there's a, a lot of aspects that are touched in an airplane uh, because of this 5G uh, interference. So, strength in numbers. Okay. Um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to uh, move on then to the the next one on the list of newly submitted topics. It came from Bryce Ford. Bryce is on the line, and rather than me read it, I'll let Bryce read it. Well, I'm not going to read it, but I will. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I will summarize. Uh, one of the things that is always questioned is is the benefit that. Um, aircraft-based observations provide to the forecast models, uh, what improvements they make, and that's uh, uh, including uh, AMDAR, or as we call it here, MEDCARS, water vapor measurement, TAMDAR, all sources of aircraft-based observations, and certainly you know, ADS-C, ADS-B, weather, and, and so forth will begin to become more prevalent going forward. One of the things that's always questioned is, okay, now we, if we're doing all this, what benefit does it make to us in aviation? And I think that we ought to be able to have a better uh, substantiation of what those benefits are provided um, by the modeling gurus, if you will, um, that can provide the explanation of that value proposition for all operations if you if you contribute more data you're going to get better weather forecasts and that's going to benefit you in this way and that's something that that connection is very seldom understood in developing you know the business case if you will so so say a little bit more um bryce about um about um I mean, we've we've you know this has been a an FPA topic either indirectly or directly um, on 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 multiple occasions. I believe I can say with with some some confidence. And 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 it 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 strikes me that that what you're after here is not proving that that more a aircraft based observations uh, equals better forecast performance what i what i what i sense you're going after here is what is that better how, how do we quantify that better forecast performance and turn it into the, the the benefit story that 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 can then be used to justify um you know ha- having additional equipment on 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 perhaps non-traditional aircraft or something like that yeah, I, I would agree with that. We've talked about that um, many times in the past. We had a whole series of um, of uh, sessions on quantifying benefits, which is always you know a difficult thing to do. Um, and and I think I agree with you that the focus. I think I think most everybody understands. Yeah, okay, there. If there's more data that goes in, then the forecast will be better. What most people don't understand is, okay, that means if I invest in providing more data, I will get benefit out of that that 
improves my operation. Okay, so, yeah. you know, if I could in engage in this subject, uh, I mean, first, uh, almost every weather center, uh, you know, to include National Weather Service, UK Met, ECMWF, and others, have an extensive list of value added of individual observations. Aircraft data is among those. So I think there's plenty of information uh, that's out there. Uh, second, <clears throat> uh, you know, to me, there's a misconception in our in our business that says more data equals more better. Um, what we need is the right data at the right places at the right time. Um, and, and so, you know, we're spending a lot of time oversampling in some areas uh, and we continue to undersample in other areas. Uh, and so just adding data does not necessarily improve the model. The data has to come from the right places around the globe. It has to be at the right time and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, I personally believe that the future of NWP is going to revolve around LEO constellations that will give us optimized distribution of data, uh, where we can have a global data set that's really going to improve NWP. I think that's where things are going to. And just just because uh, j just because um, I'm I'm not always up on all the acronyms, LEO is low Earth orbiting satellites. You're talking about right, Ralph? That is correct. Uh, okay. That is absolutely correct. I mean, uh, uh, there is a, a lot of uh, private organizations that have LEO satellites up there already that are selling data, uh, and that data is having a significant improvement on models already. And the majority of the uh, of the National Weather Services around the globe are looking at potentially launching more LEO satellites for the express purpose of collecting. Um, uh, you know, microwave imager or sounder data to improve NWP data. Uh, and keep in mind, one of the big differences, um, you know, at the end of the day, we're trying to improve the global model because if you have a better global model, you're going to get better initial conditions, which will enhance the regional models as well, which means you need to have global data sets. So if I add, on, add in a lot of aircraft data over the United States at uh, 20 to 30,000 feet, that's not necessarily going to help the global model problem when I'm still not getting a lot of data over the oceans or Siberia or whatever. The LEO satellites are going to take care of that for us. Don? Um, yeah, I just want to, I mean, I agree with 90% of what Ralph said. I, uh, you know, we, we obviously need uh, ubiquitous coverage of to collect data from, from global models. But I do want to say that when he, you know, he used the term, which is one of my terms, is right place, right time, is that we do need aircraft observations in the boundary layer because the LEOs and others don't fully, you know, give us what we need in the boundary layer, right? So I don't want to totally throw out what was been discussed here. Um, I, I tend to agree with Ralph that, you know, in terms of upper level observations, uh, what he was saying is 100%, I think, on the mark, and the investments need to be put in the right places. Uh, but I do think we need, we have a long way to go because we're not using global models to run computational fluid dynamics uh, in urban areas to get wind captured properly for the air taxi industry. We need, we are going to need more ubiquitous data, and that is going to mean that the more we can get off the aircraft. Uh, especially drone and other types of aircraft, that, that we're going to fill some gaps that we really need to fill. That's all I wanted to add. Yeah, uh, with with the LEOs and, and GEOs being remotely sensed data, um, you're always going to need in situ observations to be able to calibrate and verify that what you're getting are are reasonable. At least that's my opinion. And and aircraft based observations at any density needs to be able to provide that feedback to operations um, from in situ, observ uh, in situ observations. We don't rely entirely on satellites for all the da data assimilated into models. We still use radio sounds, regardless of the fact that they're a hazard to aviation, they uh, you know, pollute our environment, and they're very, very expensive. So. Yeah, think of yeah, and I want to say, I, of course, we have to have enough. We have to have enough for the validation. I didn't want to poo-poo that we don't need them. We need them. The question is, what do we need? How much? You know, stuff like that. And and I and uh, I, I, was that you, Justin, or there was somebody else trying to talk and they got stepped on? So, 
Yeah, that's okay. Me. I'm still in shock at how uh, agreeable Don has been today with everything that everyone's saying. Um, <laughs> but no, the uh, don't let the stigma of UAS being 400 feet and below um, be what you think about, especially. I mean, even in the short term future, that's that 400 foot rule is not going to apply to the bigger operators with time. Uh, and especially like, um, you know, we have a partnership with Beta where we purchased some aircraft, some EV tall aircraft that are short range, but we'll be, they'll be flying in the same airspace that everybody else is in, um, you know, at cruise altitude. So there is, uh, to speak to the radio songs, you know, there are alternatives that will be out there that will be introduced very soon, you know, 2023 or so, where we may not need those anymore if we're able to transfer a lot of this over to those EV tall or, or other um drone aircraft that we're flying so don't don't get too stuck on 400 feet and below when you think of uas thank you sir lee you're up next and then brother kosak after lee okay uh i just want to provide some site uh, evidence uh, especially for you and leo uh it's really a constant uh, challenge uh, even at this stage the cloud penetrating ability and also during the covid 19 uh, due to the uh, global uh, uh uh, reduction in airline operations, uh, we do see at NSEP uh, uh, model performance, uh, North American model and global model do have downgraded uh, uh, focus skills uh, due, due to the reduction in uh, assimilation of uh, MDAR data. Basically, I just want to put, put that as a side uh, evidence. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Lee. John? Yeah, um, I don't recognize people by their uh, voices yet, but um, Andrew McClure made a, uh, a note in the uh, chat section uh, question, actually, can Leo sats completely re replace eyes and machinery in the location where conditions are needed? I don't, I, we had an intense discussion going there. I wasn't sure if that question got answered. Uh, this is Andy. I think, I think, you know, A, it's kind of, a, a deep rabbit hole <laughs> to go into right now, but um, it occurs to me that in order to predict conditions at point A for people who are on approaches or operating in the boundary layer, you need to know something about what's going on upstream from there, because that's where the weather is coming from. Uh, I live in Alaska and a lot of the places where we need the weather don't have anything significant in the way of infrastructure or even air taxi flights upstream from where you need the weather. There's, there's giant holes out there that I don't see them being filled by air taxis, private aircraft, or satellite observations. Yeah, I don't think that's a rabbit hole so much as that's a really good comment. <laughs> oh, thanks. Steve Dar. Thanks, Matt, and, and thanks, uh, Bryce, for bringing this up um, and for all the comments that have been made. Um, <clears throat> not sure where we get when we get to. Um, assigning. Uh, organizers and and putting stuff on the agenda but uh, I, you know I've uh, in the past had panels where we've talked about the forecast skill um, and data denial studies for um, uh, that showed how important aircraft based observations are to uh, forecast uh, <clears throat> skill and and um, and even some some really interesting things about uh, more data um, uh, making for greater forecast accuracy um, without working on the the underlying forecast models. Mm -hmm. So um, I think <clears throat> it's been a few years since we've we visited that. Um, I'd be happy to try to uh, organize uh, you know a, a session in this area if it, if it's time to uh, revisit it and. Um, and to Andy's uh, particular question, um, I would put in a plug for ADSB weather uh, received via um, uh, satellite 
uh, which is something that uh, might be coming down the road if the FAA decides that use of uh, satellite received ADSB information in Alaska uh, is uh, is worthwhile. You know, the, in you know Alaska and the entire Northwest uh, could potentially benefit um, from observations out over the oceans that we don't currently have any way to get, uh, but with ADSB weather might uh, might solve that. Thank you, Steve. Uh, yeah, Steve, uh, I I agree with you. Um, what occurred to me while you were talking about that would be long range uh, unmanned aircraft systems with ADSB uh, reporting capability operating out in the areas where there's really nothing else going on and operating at several different levels uh, above the surface and uh, giving meteorologists a better picture of what's actually happening out there. Yeah, well, the, uh, the fish monitoring fleet of UAS is up there in Alaska that uh, goes out and, and uh, operates in that area. If they had ADSP weather equipage, would be a really good uh, source of that lower level atmospheric uh, conditions. So now you're talking. Cool. Okay, duly noted across the board. Um, I, I guess my my final um, just comment on this one is I, I I think it's a I think it's a wonderful topic area. What I don't want to do is repeat what we've done in the past. So so if there's if if there's a different angle, if there's new information, if there's if there's uh, you know if if we if we see a particular area where this kind of application could could really be brought to bear and 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 provide improvements then 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 i'm all for it i, I just i i don't we, we we talk to ourselves enough already i don't want us to talk to ourselves any more than we need to i appreciate that the um <clears throat> the COVID experience might be an interesting one to renew on uh, to see what the downturn in uh, in observations from aircraft has actually done uh, from a forecast perspective. Yeah, I think uh, did, did, did we not did, did we did we not have a whole session about that like two F pause ago? Um, I thought. Well, wh whatever. In, in yeah, any that, that that's been that's been studied to death. So, yeah, I think we have plenty of information on that. Yep. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I think we got plenty of information and, uh, you know, candidly stated, uh, if uh, the loss of that data would have been compensated with the purchase of existing commercial data buys, I think the impact could have been mitigated considerably. So yeah, the, I don't I, I don't think we should use COVID as as the benchmark for the requirement for aircraft observations. Let's 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 go pre-COVID. I don't think anybody argues that the significance of aircraft observations and improving the models is is very very significant, and that we can't afford to lose that capability. If that's the concern, we need to have aircraft observations. The question you know that we're bringing up is where's the bigger need right now for aircraft observations? And my argument would be. Once after we get COVID done and after everything's flying again and all the standard observations are coming in off the aircraft, my argument would be the need is below 5,000 feet, right? Because we are totally blind below 5,000 feet. Our models handle the upper levels pretty well. The models don't handle the boundary layer very well. We don't have enough data. So that's the only thing I'm saying. I, we're not, this is not a, a, a competition. It's just about where's the gaps and where's the where you know what's going to be the biggest impacts in the future if we don't close those gaps. And I, you know, with drones flying at mid levels, like uh, Justin said, we're going to have 3,000 foot uh, regional airport to regional airport heavy lift drones carrying cargo. Uh, we're going to have much heavier traffic and density of traffic below, uh, you know, 5,000 feet. Um, I would, you know, what we're saying is where's the need, right? And I think that's I think that's the main the main takeaway I have from this. Okay. Well, there's a there's a definitely then uh, a potential connection between 
this topic in general that was that 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 we first started out this discussion with and perhaps the ABO weather benefits topic if they were focused in fact on that that lower layer of the atmosphere so let's let's keep that in mind as we go forward. I'm now going to speak for Matthias, who's not here to defend himself, and and he and I have not, I repeat, not talked about these at all. So I'm literally just reading his words here. Um, Matthias has submitted a a topic idea around weather concerns for space launch, and and Bill Bauman, I'm going to ask you to perhaps, if you're still here, dang it, you left, ha. My timing is. I'm still here, Matt. Okay, so, oh, are you? oh, very, very good. That, not, that, not only am I here. I had oh, my hand oh, raised on the last oh, topic. Oh well. Oh, okay. Well, then, then let me stop, and you go back to the last topic, and then, and then you can read what's on here. I'd love to hear your comments about Matthias's suggestion too. But go ahead. Yeah, and just to quick on the last topic, one of the things that we've been kind of struggling with in FAA is not whether or not the models are improving and, and the supports improving, but what's the impact to operations. So as we improve on the HER year after year with um, new physics and getting more observations and, and whatnot, what does that do for the NAS? So does that improve NAS efficiency by 1%, 10%? Does it hurt it with more information and better models? I don't know that that's something we could get at through FPAW and have that discussion because I don't think we know the answer. But that's really what we're trying to do. If we could monetize, hey, the model improved this much, therefore the NAS was able to do this and avoid that, that would be a value. And we, we've actually tried to get that funded within Aviation Weather Division and senior leadership would not fund that type of study. But that's certainly something we'd like to be able to tell our stakeholders is because we invested $10 million in the HER, we've proved the efficiency of the NAS in thunderstorm season and uh, that saved $100 million or whatnot. So is the research worth it? Yeah, and, and that's a, that's a, that's a, I, I agree with everything you just said, Bill. And, and uh, moreover, uh, uh, when we get to the next slide, which has, has the, the final submitted topic, which came from Lee Jang, I, I was, I, I thought immediately of what Lee put in his topic submission as how it might be related to this. So, Thank you for that. Um, uh, let me go on to Matthias's and, and, and just ask you to hang on there for a sec, Bill, because you have sure. you know about 83 million times more about this than I do. Uh, but, but you know, we, 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 we say new entrants and, and I automatically snap right to UAS, UAM. But, but there are also some high-flying new entrants that, that have a, a unique set of, of, of requirements that whose impact on the NAS as um, processes are currently set up is significant. Um, and and Matthias is, is sort of wondering out loud in this topic suggestion if it would be beneficial to, to, to find out from the folks who, who support space launch from NASA, from the Air Force, uh, from the Army, from the FAA and the private sector, what criteria do they use to make go no go decisions and and you know what 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 sorts of of um, needs do they have as we go forward? And I'll shut up there before I screw it up even further. Yeah, well, for space launch, um, it doesn't matter who the agency is; the rules are the same. The weather launch commit criteria, whether you're at a government range or a private range, is the same. So whether you're launching from Kennedy Space Center or Brownsville, Texas you follow the same weather launch commit criteria. Um, it is conservative, and, and there's many reasons for that going back many years, but there is pressure, Matthias is right, especially from private industry, to try and relax those um, requirements. So that's certainly a range issue. Um, the FAA pretty much follows for space launch, not pretty much, they follow for space launch that launch commit criteria. And I don't know that the FAA really has a dog in the fight over that specifically, but the FAA is more worried about traffic around launches and that sort of thing, air, regular um, you know, commercial air traffic for the most part, as a plane takes off over my head from Dulles. Yeah. So, so Bill, if, if I could add on to what you just brought up, 
You know, again, going back to my government days, you're correct. Uh, all the requirements are the same, but the difference occurs in the measuring of the data. Uh, my experience has been is that um, uh, we in the Air Force, when I was still there, we, uh, we had uh, very explicit rules on where our sensors would be, uh, the calibration of those sensors and so forth. And what we've discovered is that um, certainly as the military handed off more and more responsibilities to private launch organizations, um, they haven't necessarily changed the requirements, but they've positioned some of their own sensors and because the sensors are, you know, in different places, uh, they can potentially provide different results than than the certified sensors, and that can cause uh, confusion uh, and uh, you know differences on when a launch should take place and when it shouldn't take place. This is Don. Yeah, you know, the bottom line is criteria and requirements are based on uncertainty and risk, and you know, people if people are looking at different data and they have better data than other people, they may have a higher certainty about what they're seeing that, again, would allow them to narrow the um, range and become less conservative. Conservatism is based just on the fact that you don't know what's going, it's the uncertainty factor, right? So I think we need to look at, you know, in general, what are the gaps in these areas that are driving the uncertainty that causes the requirements debate? And, and is there private sector data available that they're using to make their own decisions that's not getting into the, you know, into the, into the government and it's causing some of these, uh, you know, some of these hiccups? And for the mm -hmm. most part, the private ranges are the ones that, uh, the commercial ranges that have less sensor data. If you look at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, Vandenberg, they're loaded with sensors, including uh, networks of electric field mills to measure the charge in the cloud for things like the thick cloud rule. But to Don's point and what Ralph was saying also, what if you had an entrepreneur that could fly a field mill on a UIS in the clouds instead of trying to measure the electric field from the ground? That could certainly lower the conservatism and make more launch availability. So certainly those areas looking at uh, different ways of sensing that I, I think are ripe for discussion so yeah. this is kozak um i'm going to speak from the position of an airspace user uh, somebody who sits at the command center and watches uh areas of airspace, large chunks of airspace, especially on the East Coast, go away, um, sometimes during very um, useful times of the day uh, in anticipation of these launches. So anything that could increase the ability of whatever agency to more accurately predict the ability to launch their spacecraft in a timely fashion, I think that you would find uh, great support from the uh, the operators of um, both business general and commercial aviation uh, aircraft um, who have to fly around those closed off areas uh, during these these launch windows. Uh, there's there's so many times just like last night where uh, a wallops launch was scrubbed at the last minute. Um, after that airspace was closed for uh, you know a significant amount of time already, so anything that would allow them to shorten those airspace uh, closures um, or get the launch done on the first attempt or whatever, um, I think would be greatly appreciated by the operator community. Yeah, I think you're right, John. I was at Kennedy Space Center for the first uh, SpaceX launch when things were starting to go commercial. And for all the years prior to that, the commercial airlines never really complained about closing the airspace in the vicinity of Florida because they were all government launches and we were all doing it for the good of the government and apple pie and all that stuff. But once you had private industry launching and closing airspace for four or five or six hours, the airlines started going, wait a minute, you're, we're, it's costing us a whole lot more money to move our routes while you have a private company making money and keeping our routes closed. And that's been the main complaint now. You've got private industry closing these, and if we could do something to make those um, more available to the aircraft, 
I, I think that would be more fair for what the airlines started complaining about with private industry launches. Yeah, what? you've got um, um, airspace closures in conjunction with weather that would seem to obviously negate the ability to launch a spacecraft um, that are causing significant flow issues uh, into and out of, uh, you know, uh, Jacksonville and Miami centers, for example, and along the East Coast through Washington Center. Uh, and, and that's at a time when <laughs> we have historically low um, air traffic right now as a result of the pandemic. So as the airlines get back to their, you know, 100 uh, percent levels, um, uh, we, we could be looking at some significant issues uh, along the East Coast. Oh, and I like uh, Debbie's uh, comment in the chat section. Should the commercial space industry start participating in CDM? Oh, heck yeah. <laughs> well, should the commercial space industry start participating in, in FPAW? Double yes? <laughs> I don't know. Well, well maybe we should start. change our name. This discussion, though, is really important because it strives how private sector and again, this gets back to why we have to have, you know, close up public private partnership around this whole weather problem, because um, it's not likely the government is going to be able to afford to do some of the sensing that might be required to reduce that uncertainty. We everything that has just been said is absolutely a waste of money and, a, and it's a waste of money and it's impacting a lot of people because we haven't made the business case that even these private sectors need to start investing in some of their own weather capabilities so they can reduce the cost and the risk to the whole air traffic management system. I mean, there's, I mean, I'm getting way off topic here, but I mean, we're going to see more and more of this, right? And, and so at some point, you know, there has to be a business model and a business case that says the impacts and the ROI drive better weather sensing capabilities. Now, who pays for that? I don't know. But that's how you, you solve these problems. You get better forecasts and better predictions with better data, right? And we're, right now, we've been kind of stuck uh, where we are, but now it's starting to have reverberation. So I just, again, I think it's a good topic for more than just a space launch issue. Yeah, I, I agree with you that once the ROI is established, that's where the money comes from. There's an ROI in that investment. There's a return. And up till now, we have all said it's the government's responsibility to do the forecasts that everybody relies on, essentially. And, and, the, and the problem data, is whatever data they need to go into that is their issue. They will pay for it one way or the other. Well, the problem, though, the people that aren't paying for the data are impacting some other are impacting other companies and other businesses. And so it's a. There's no incentive for them if they're not feeling any of that pain, right? So this gets, again, into much bigger issues. But I'm just pointing something out. Weather is going to become more and more integral, connected, and impactful to the logistics and supply chain. And we're not in a good place right now to deal with these challenges because we don't have the right policies or, or whatever, right? But it's, just, it's a really good use case. Cool. I would also say it goes beyond space launch um, reentry. So um, in the past, the only real reentry vehicle we worried about was a space shuttle, and there were very strict flight rules, which were different than the launch rules for for weather. So now we've got these other commercial entities that are going to be taking tourists and whatnot uh, into low Earth orbit, and they got to come back through the atmosphere. And there are flight rules based on space shuttle for doing that with composite materials and triggering lightning and all sorts of stuff. So um, it's not just launch, it's also landing, if you will, or flight for these vehicles coming back through the atmosphere. So would that be part of this discussion or maybe a separate one, but there's all sorts of weather impacts and sensor issues with um, return to, to um, landing also. 
You know, if this weather stuff was easy, somebody would have figured it out by now. Anyhow, well, great discussion. Um, I want to uh, I want to keep on going so that we can preserve the last bit of the meeting for for putting together a, uh, a, a an agenda for our spring meeting, unless everything goes to heck, and in which case it'll be our fall meeting, and then finding some folks who would be perhaps willing to to shepherd these these topics through. Um, Matthias did have one other uh, submission, uh, which was done, um, um, I'm, I'm believing, uh, after he had a conversation with his NCAR colleague, uh, Scott Landholt, who has been investigating issues concerned with the automated measurement of mixed phase precipitation so uh, sleet and freezing rain, snow and sleet, snow and freezing rain, and how those issues may have holdover time application concerns. And the suggestion here is that it would be, um, Scott believes, worth giving the FPAW community an update on these matters. Um, I, I will just say, just, just reading this and thinking about this topic area, you know, we, we, we talk about um, larger half day sessions and then these smaller, you know, one hour ish sessions. This, this kind of feels to me like one of those one hour, uh, I don't want to say filler because that sounds so demeaning, but the, but the shorter but important session that would go after a, a, a longer session. Uh, I, I was hoping that maybe Steph, uh, Stephanie DeVito, uh, or perhaps somebody from NCAR that, to talk to this directly was on the call, but I don't see anyone in my quick spin through here. But if, if somebody is here from, from those organizations or feels like they can speak intellig more intelligently to this, Corey, you have your hand up. You speak intelligently about everything. Hi, Matt. Thanks. Uh, yeah, just some insight from the A4A side and the airlines. Um, you know, basically, um, uh, the FAA folks with working with Transport Canada and APS, which is the testing group up there in Canada, has uh, shown or trying to show that multiple precipitation types that aren't really laid out clearly in the holdover times should be um, included or or basically using more of a aggregate score than when you have a precipitation type when you have uh, say light snow freezing rain sleet um, the and there's only one intensive intensity uh, qualifier that can be used so if it's light that means that all three of those precipitation types are light uh, but they're trying to say that um, maybe they're not all light but that's that um, rule is based on ICAO Annex 3 rules for METAR. So the first and the predominant precipitation is listed first. So if it's if it's light snow, freezing rain pellets, then it's uh, the light snow is the predominant precipitation type and the others are equal or less than in intensity. So uh, they're just trying to look at some data and, and that's what Scott did. He looked at 20 years of data to see how many times um, precipitation types such as like heavy pellets and snow uh, fell at certain airports. And those really aren't laid out clearly in the holdover times, but, but what the airlines do is they take the most restrictive um, holdover time or allowance time if it's ice pellets and use that. And so that's the airlines uh, response to this is we're already using the most restrictive holdover times just because they're not clearly laid out. And you can think about Think about playing like the daily three lottery numbers. Think how many different combinations you can have with three different values. And and then you throw in an intensity. Um, and these these, um, you know, heavy snow pellet. Um, rain events showing up in a METAR are very rare. Uh, so, um, you know, Scott's doing his job as an SME for uh, for the FAA. We've also talked to him about this. Um, so he's objective. I don't think it's would be wise for the A4A to get involved in this um, this presentation, but that's just some background on um, you know what uh, 
what this topic is about. And um, I think sometimes uh, the FAA through APS says that we're going to put restrictions on because we have this theory that uh, you're, you're not using the most um, restrictive uh, process, but the airlines are saying, well, you need to prove that using scientific methods that um, that we that these mixed precipitation events are are not following the guidelines that we're using currently in the holdover times rather than just uh, assuming that it's it's truth without testing it first. So that's just some background on the topic. OK, thank you, Corey. And for those who don't know, Corey manages FedEx's Met Shop um, and is, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, Corey, you're, you're currently the chair of the A4A Met Committee, correct? Yes, that's true. And um, Randy Baker is the co-chair, so he'll be the chairman next year. And he's worked a lot with Scott and and folks at NCAR on this um, on this topic. He's actually presenting on behalf of A4A next Tuesday at the SAE G12 ground de-ice meeting, uh, which is being held virtually. So he has a presentation together and that basically outlines uh, more in depth what I've uh, said here today. So yeah, it's uh, the cargo coalition for the uh, A4A right now with <laughs> FedEx and UPS um, as the chair and co-chair. Very good, well, rock on card box haulers. Bill Bauman. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Uh, you're right. From FAA perspective, Stephanie, Stephanie DeVito probably could uh, speak on this issue, but we are doing work on the present weather sensor, and uh, luckily in Atlantic City this winter had a number of mixed phase events and collected a whole bunch of data on that. So the status of the work on present weather sensor, uh, the observations, the algorithm work could be part of this discussion as it applies to the holdover time uh, tables. Um, uh, Bruce, uh, you're still on, right? Yeah, Bruce Carmichael is still on. I, I, I was sitting here thinking about um, about F pause from days of yore when um, when the the liquid water equivalent topic came up, and Tom Fahey with an E in his last name um, was was uh, was championing that. I think some of our more uh, shall I say interesting F pause meetings. Uh, sometimes centered around this particular topic. Am I remembering that correctly, Bruce? Yeah, he was uh, he was a major spokesman in the industry for for getting it uh, getting it done so that the airlines could uh, operate a lot more efficiently. Uh, the um, uh, Josh Paris has picked up some of uh, of Tom's uh, steam, I think, in recent times. Uh, Josh is much nicer than Tom. <laughs> John Kozak. Hey, um, so uh, in the chat, uh, Marilyn Pearson suggested involving Chuck Enders from AFS 200, who produces the holdover times uh, in this discussion. Cool. Good. Thank you, Marilyn. And uh, I did suggest that because this discussion has been one that the Icing Steering Committee has uh, has been thinking about for at least uh, a few years, the intensity, the precipitation, how it's provided and produced. I'm no longer with the FAA, but I was part of the icing steering committee and Chuck is very involved. So you might want to uh, address it with him. Did Matt just leave the meeting? You may have. <laughs> I think we're on our own. <laughs> That's dangerous. <laughs> Stand by. He'll be back. Yeah. Hey, welcome back, Matt. <laughs> and you're on mute. Yeah, I got kicked off of my own by my own system. Now that that's that's showing you the love right there. That happened to me about me five months. Then for some reason, I'm uh, 
I'm becoming a Zoom fan as time marches on, but don't tell anybody I said that. They were all organizing against you there while you left, Matt. <laughs> uh, well, they would have to have done it quickly because I wasn't gone that long. <laughs> um, okay, so so did the mixed phase precipitation conversation end? I'm going to take silence to mean yes. Yeah, I think so, Matt. Uh, if this is going to be next spring, um, uh, a lot will probably change on it as, um, you know, we're 10 months away or whatever from from that meeting. So, uh, but yeah, hopefully uh, there's some resolution to it by then. Okay. Very good. Thank you, Corey. Uh, let me see where the devil I am. That's what I want. Okay. All right. Um, and then the last topic, but certainly from my perspective, and I'm prejudiced, not the least, is a, a topic, I think a very timely topic, you can tell where my prejudices lie, submitted by Li Jiang on basically ATM weather integration. And, and he starts off the, the, the submission by saying, remember the ketchup mustard chart? Are we there yet or has that vision changed? And, and then he, uh, he, he, he makes reference, Lee makes reference to a congressional mandate to put next gen ATM in place by 2025, but additional complexity that won't enable us to get there fully. And, uh, and clearly we see now that the, the, uh, uh, the, the, this uh, this is going to sound horrible. I got to be careful now. the 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 story that is being that is being told about next gen is in the process of of shifting from one oriented around next gen to one oriented around the NAS future vision twenty thirty five type of story or the or the trajectory-based operations type of story, and and um, and I'll stop there and invite Lee if he's on. I hadn't looked to see if he's still here with us. He yeah, uh, I'm here, uh, Matt. Uh, thank you. I, I think you, your short uh, uh, overview just hit all the points I want to talk about. Uh, uh, Really, from the early days of next gen till now, you know, on the uh, ATM side, uh, are we still planning on uh, maybe to a large extent replacing the uh, radar based uh, control to GPS separation? This is also relevant to the tra trajectory based stuff. But from all the recent uh, years uh, development uh, on weather and ATM integration, uh, especially I remember when Don Birchhoff still at NOAA NWS Office of Science Technology leading the so-called uh, 40 weather cube. Uh, I mean, last few years, the, that notion uh, seems to have been uh, faded away. And uh, in the meantime, we do see enhancement here and there. There are two major industrial contracts uh, at the FA, one is uh, the uh, uh, CSS Common Support Service Weather. The other one is NWP, uh, uh, the uh, the Next Gen Weather Program. But those seems to focus on integration of existing uh, capabilities or tools, not at the point of uh, implementing or uh, driving towards a operationally uh, doable. ATM and weather integration, and we know why uh, it is so complicated, especially if some of you are at the last uh, last week's uh, uh, air travel con uh, airspace capacity session, especially Jim uh, Evans talk about uncertainty in convective weather forecast and how unusable they are even at you know a short time scale beyond a couple hours. So all these things, I think it's you know, on the program level, high level, we the community might be benefit from a update from major program offices, probably uh, FA and uh, some some other agencies on a possible uh, plan change. On the technical side, there also there might 
be also be worthwhile to talk about some of the uh, uh, advancement made in the uh, in the lab. Uh, at least, you know, the uh, uh, are we still uh, fulfilling the steps? You know, uh, especially level three, level four integration when we constructed the uh, so-called uh, catch-up master uh, chart in 2010, 2011 time frame, I think. Okay, so these are things are very interesting, you know, to me to, and uh, I believe to to many people in the uh, audience. Okay. Thank you, Lee. And uh, yeah, it was 2010 and, and I remember it like it was yesterday because for me it was yesterday. Um, but um, yeah, that, that was uh, 11 years ago now that the ketchup and mustard chart made its debut, as I recall, at an AMS annual meeting um, in that time frame. And then shortly thereafter, or maybe even before, I don't remember which order, at an FPOM meeting. So uh, absolutely. Um, any any uh, any comments from the peanut gallery on on Lee's proposal? And by the way, Don, I, I threw this uh, this uh, uh, this picture up for you since Lee talked about the, the 4D weather cube and the and the that that forbidden phrase that single authoritative source. Okay, so yep, yep. bringing back memories. I think we started this sure. in 2002. <laughs> okay, is it, is it memories or nightmares? <laughs> <laughs> well. It's it's a disappointment in our inability to execute, but you know I guess that's more yeah. But well, so I I strongly advocate that we present this and talk about it because uh, you know like you I was a member of the Nuke, I was at the table as we argued about this kind of stuff, and uh, you know as we move down the path of having more and more private weather providers, the concept of a single authoritative source is going to become more and more of a challenge. So how how is this going to work in the national airspace? I think uh, we need to relive in this discussion and come up with a plan so we can actually execute something. Yeah, I think, you know, what I think is evolved in my mind is that there are certain elements of single authoritative data you really still need in air traffic management. You even in, even in the UAV or even in the in the class G airspace when you eventually want to have BV loss, there still has to be some single authoritative source for the deconfliction, for the volume reservation, and all that stuff, because you can't have multiple weather companies putting data in and having different USSs using different data. So I still believe that there is requirement. Now, I, I think it's scaled back quite a bit. I think that, um, I think that, for instance, the government doesn't have to solely be the arbitrator and the developer of the data cube. I believe in the Class G airspace, you can have weather service providers be the authoritative source through some kind of a mechanism for RFP and and proving that they have the ability to do it um, because, um, you know, I think that's capable. But I think so. I think it's gotten I think that there is still a requirement, but I think we should really relook at skinning back what exactly is required and then figuring out how the private sector and others can play so that we can get that innovation going. So I think we're on the same page, Ralph, right? Kind of on that. Fully agreed. But, uh, you know, I think the key is we need to get out of the talking phase into the doing phase. Well, we've been talking for 20 years, Ralph. We're still talking. It's 2021. Yep. Yeah. Any other any other comments uh, from folks on on Lee's idea? And Matt, one uh, one one more aspect I, I want to add is you know I'm I'm thinking uh, really if you look at the the past research studies really a lot of those focusing on the uh, the call self uh, adjusted or uh, or automated separation between aircrafts these are uh you know intuitively very hard to do for uh airline aircraft but if we take that idea for instance to apply those some of the technology or source along the lines of ua uav you know uh utm scenario you know of course i'm not saying it's safety is not important but comparing to 
you know, for, uh, fully passenger uh, aircrafts, there seems to be more opportunity to do ex experiment uh, to test those, uh, you know, uh, that can fully integrate the weather to do self uh, adjusted uh, autonomy uh, flight for US. Then, you know, take that back, you know, some of those might be usable for uh, civil aviation as well, basically. Uh, of course, right now it's, it seems to be open new box of uh, uh, direction that may need a lot of more uh, in-depth studies and research. <clears throat> uh, Bill Bauman, did I see you uh, uh, unkey yourself a second ago? Yeah, I was just going to say um, we mentioned NWP CSS weather and that of course, it's still an active program, and that's our program management organization. Steve Kim leads that, so um, he's spoken about that before. We could certainly do an update on that. Trajectory-based operations is still ongoing, um, and uh, um, as a matter of fact, the ATO just talked about that uh, with NextGen about a week ago, and we're looking at and still working on integrating weather. You know, what's the big thing you need for TVO? You need accurate winds. Well, different systems use different wind forecasts, which shouldn't be, and, and NWP is supposed to take care of that. But um, as Ralph and Don have alluded to, it's 2021 and it's not in place yet, so there's still work to be done. So I think we can talk through that um, if we want to have a status update on that from both the program management organization, from my aviation weather division, talk about some of the research things we're doing. And um, we've also started working much harder from my division perspective with the ATO to understand their requirements. And as I've seen in my 40 year career, the operators don't know what they want and the meteorologists don't know what they need. And getting those two trains to meet is never that easy. So we're working more with them on dynamic weather on the glass. Uh, they say they want weather on the glass. Well, what does that mean? Oh, we want weather on the glass. No, that's not what you need. So it's that back and forth and understanding how to integrate weather into ATM just on their scope is difficult to do. Uh, a lot of the work we've done previously has been transitioning research to operations to the National Weather Service. Well, that's not integrated into ATM. That's for meteorologists to use. So we're trying to work more on integrating weather into ATM for controllers to use and to direct aircraft. So I think we certainly could have a discussion on this and uh, provide updates. I see Don has eagerly got his hand up and waving it. So I'll let Don go. But I, I loved your comment on uh, operators don't know what they need and we don't know what they want or whatever. That's beautiful. That, that's the dichotomy, right? Uh, and most of us don't even know what we can do. And that's the other problem. We got people working on projects that don't even know what the state of the technology could allow. So I put that as the, as the third problem. But I think that I would try to bifurcate uh, what's happening with the current next gen, you know, CSS weather with what we're trying to do uh, in the lowest levels, because, you know, we're talking about trying to integrate into a legacy system that, you know, let's face it, the reason why we've had so many challenges with this is we're trying to deal with legacy systems and we're trying to, you know, we're trying to evolve and plug in really cutting edge data and capabilities that it's just hard. Right. And and then you're dealing with culture and then you're dealing with end users that have been doing it the same way for 50 years. I like the idea of the clean slate and looking at this from a pure let's maybe we should look at this from the U, from the USS and the UTM perspective because it's clean. Right. There's no uh, I, I that's why I love working in it, because all the systems that are being jet developed by the UTMs are all modern open source data systems. You know, they're easy to plug data into. They're easy to work with. There's no past legacy culture or baggage. And we could maybe, I, and I think, Lee, I don't know, did you say let's do it first with the drones uh, or was it the other way around? I got mixed up there. But, but yeah, I mean, I think if you want to make progress, you, you got to go where, where you have the least amount of resistance and pain, right? And I think there is an opportunity there. Yeah, yeah, I fully agree uh, with uh, you. Your what you just said, Don. Uh, I think uh, especially mentioned uh, there seems to be much less pinpoints or or legacy system to 
to incorporate or to consider, uh, especially if we start something fresh from UTM uh, uh, scenario. I I know NASA and uh, NFA probably just ended a project, their probably first phase project on UTM architecture. Uh, I, I, I listened to some of their their talks. Unfortunately, you know, uh, it's just ended. I'm not sure what's the next phase going to be. And also by talking to a few a few of the uh, carriers like uh, Amazon and uh, UPS, I understand last year we they only got the uh, uh, part uh, 135 approval. My understanding that the approval just, you know, it's right now at, at this current stage, it's really very strict and very safe. Of course, uh, the uh, operations are on certain uh, defined route uh, without much uh, deviation. Although we all wa want to see, you know, the potential, especially uh, when when te technology is ready, the potential of massive uh, U U U uh, UAS or small UAS uh, operations at, at part of our daily life, you know. But if they are so constrained, so or we use very similar approach as we do for civil aviation that might you know uh make us force us to go to a direction that that uh, we suddenly find oh this is something if we think from a different angle solve the problem from a, really a, uh, using a slightly different approach that might you know give us a benefit of speed up uh and probably have a brand new thinking uh for the uh you you UTM scenario. Uh, once it's success, successful, some of the the, the uh, concept not being able to test in the civil aviation in in uh, ATM can learn from those too. You know, it's a uh, there. There seems to be a, a great opportunity there. You know, but uh, I just think that uh, we probably had a time to make some breakthroughs with the new uh, evolving uh, situation right now. Very good. Thank you, Lee. Anybody else uh, on, on this particular topic? Hearing nothing, uh, I'm going to suggest that we take another five minute up and down break and uh, we'll make it eight minutes and come back at five until two Eastern time, at which point my goal, our goal will be to fill out this form right here and uh, to have a spring 2022 general topic description and uh, folks who would be willing and able to lead it listed on this form based on our previous discussion. So I will see you back in now seven and one half-ish or so minutes at five until two Eastern time. All right, I've got uh, 155 Eastern time, now 156. So I just barely made it uh, by the skin of my teeth. Thank you. Welcome back, everybody. Nancy um, Mendonca, am I pronouncing your last name correctly? I hear about 43 different yes. pronunciations of it. Um, can you can you talk a little bit about what you put in the chat? What what you what 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 your uh, I'm I'm not sure I I'm I'm I got the flick yet. So you can kind of organize the topics as kind of an, you know, educational, here's what we're doing, you know, awareness, so people are more aware of different efforts, um, you know, kind of a discussion around the challenges. At, on occasion, I derogatorily, you know, refer to it as admiring the problem kind of topics. <laughs> yeah. um, I think we, yeah, I know. Um, I think we also have, you know, have topics that are kind of, um, kind of like the roadmap status one. Hey, we're, you know, we're, Here's a here's a challenge. Here's where we're on. We're get, moving towards solving the challenge, and you know, and making progress. Get you know, here are timelines, gaps, shortfalls, schedule, those kind of things. Um, one I didn't put in the chat was needed research. I think that's always a, a a valuable one because it makes more people aware of you know where where they 
could potentially contribute because I think folks do inherently want to help solve the problems. But I always kind of, you know, the brainstorming, roll up your sleeves, let's, you know, it's not quite a, a formal road mapping effort, but, you know, throw out some ideas. So what would you tell to the space launch community to address some of the issues? You know, you've got, hey, you know, one weather source or, you know, authority of sources or however you want to word it is an issue. Paying for collecting the weather is an issue. I mean, you guys want it. You guys want a different standard. What are you going to do to develop it? Here's a pathway to get there. So kind of that, you know, and, and here's forums where you guys need to participate in. So kind of that, hey, here's a here's a product that you can put out and give to a community to make progress on an issue. Okay, and so is 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 the observation that that I that, you know basically guidance to suggest that that we should have something of that sort in our list here, or that we should, for instance, orient the space launch and landing weather concerns topic in in the way that you've just described, as opposed to a uh, education discussion awareness kind of format um more the more the former i think i mean you've got a whole bunch of smes who are contributing their time here it, it you know to get them and to get them more involved and to take advantage of all of the expertise that you're pulling together to you know work together to solve a problem or to you know or at least identify potential pathways to it it seems like a a better use of their time than, you know, admiring, admiring problems. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Well, that's a, that's a, um, that's a, a great lead in then to um, basically the last hour that we have together or whatever portion of it, uh, it takes us to, to get this done. We've got a spring uh, 2022 FPA meeting planned uh, in person, probably in the D.C. area, but uh, th that has yet to be settled. Uh, similarly, the dates have yet to be uh, um, ironed out. Um, and and this year, um, you know, one additional wrinkle is that if the 2021 FPA fall meeting in person, the the Federal Agency Aviation Weather Review. Uh, fails to take place because of COVID, the the intent will be to to take this session, this meeting that we craft here in the next hour or so, and move it up by six months into uh, October of 2021. So uh, so so that's a that's a, a a new wrinkle for us. Something we've frankly uh, th that I'm aware of. Um, not not done before, but these are uh, interesting and unique times we're living in. So uh, we have to be prepared for a, a variety of things taking place. So so what what I what I'd like to do is is to um, you know identify um, either um, uh, from amongst the topics submitted, and I've sort of I've listed their titles as they were submitted in the box off to the right there, um, uh, select which three of those or three other topics that we haven't even discussed here today, or maybe that we've discussed kind of um, in, in, a, in a sideways fashion, uh, which, which three of those would go into those primary topic slots? And then um, do, we, do we want to have a um, a uh, an, an update of of previous FPA topics led once again, hopefully by Tom Ryan. Um, you know, if if I would like to have, frankly, a an organizational update, uh, you know, slot reserved for Matthias and I, so we can chat about some of the stuff that we have would have been working on over the last six months, and then we would have space for one more um, smaller topic to to fit in if if that's the model we want to follow if 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 the group thinks this is you know not a good model or matt i don't want to you you've talked my ear off today i don't want to hear you talk for the next year then then and and therefore your fpa organizational update should go away i'm i'm, I'm good with that too i just 
I just want to hear from this the, this group of people who has spent a good bit of their time today, anywhere from from uh, you know 38 to 41 or 42 people uh, have, have spent a large part of, of your time today talking about this, uh, discussing, debating, working with us. So uh, let's 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 put together what we've heard and in a, in a meaningful way. Do not get hung up over order. We'll work through that as time goes on. Really, it's just a question of sticking topics in here and identifying leads or co-leads or, heck, if enough people are, are, are willing to volunteer, their entire group that would be working on these. So I will shut up and, and listen to your input and try to keep up with it as fast and furious as it is likely to come. Ready, set, go. Dan, you have your hand up. I guess that means if we're going to be civilized about this, you get to go first. I'd rather not be civilized, but I just wanted uh, a follow up on a prior conversation. I just and since uh, uh, Marilyn and Bryce are both here, it, it, do they agree? And because I was thinking the same thing as what you mentioned, which was low altitude weather in ABO might uh, at this point be nicely um, uh, combined. And I just wanted to hear from them as to if they would agree with that. I do. This is Marilyn. Uh, I think I was I was contemplating the same thing as I was listening to the discussion. I have no problem with that. Ralph, you got your paw up. Yeah, I, uh, you know, as the uh, guy working weather data standards for UAS, low altitude weather is a critical component. Uh, so I I definitely be interested in helping lead that. And I think it needs to be a, a topic and we got to talk about, you know, what technologies we're bringing to the table, uh, what uh, policies we need to adjust and uh, what metrics we bring to the, t you know, how we're going to evaluate potential providers. And ultimately, you know, this plays into all kinds of things uh, because, um, you know, spectrum interference with 5G is a big deal because we're talking about using 5G to transmit weather information to drones. Uh, we're talking about how this fits into the next gen status and so forth. So I think low altitude weather is an absolutely big deal that uh, this group needs to address because uh, it's not just UAS. You're talking, you know, that's going to impact helicopters, ETALs, vertiports, all kinds of things. Okay. All right. And I, I actually uh, uh, heard Ralph say he'd be happy to work with. So Ralph, I'm going to we don't have to say lead or co-lead or anything. I'm just going to put your name down here if, if I have your permission to do that. Please do that. Okay. Who would like to join with Ralph? Ralph's a very famous person. I would think there'd be people lined up to want to join with Ralph. Uh-oh. Or to manage him. Uh, you know, I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll work with Ralph on this. This is Don. This is Don. And throw me down as a uh, note taker, as a secretary. <laughs> uh, let's, right. let's see. Rich, right. put me down. Oh, listen to this. There are people who are lined up for this sucker. All right. Um, let's see. Randy, you got. You're the first one I see with your hand up. Go ahead, sir. I thought there were other people ahead of me, but uh, that's okay. Um, if the fall meeting turns out to be virtual and we put the, uh, the delay the Tim until the spring, then um, I would suggest maybe the secondary topic under topic two, you know, as a, as a one hour kind of be a lead into that or an overview of what we have planned since we'll have more planning by then regardless. Yeah, I, I saw your comment in the chat earlier, and and um, you know I'm I'm just I'm just doing too many things at once to have replied to it. But but let me throw that out there, and and, and let's let's just talk about it for a minute. So, if this agenda becomes the fall meeting virtual virtual meeting agenda, meaning that the federal agency review is pushed to the spring of 2022. Randy is suggesting that that perhaps either this slot here or this slot here or this slot here 
be replaced with a one-hour preview of the federal agency review. Am I stating that correctly, Randy? Yeah, because I, you know, like I said, we'll uh, we'll we'll definitely be farther along okay. uh, even if we don't do it. So we can at least provide a an overview of of what we have and and maybe a short discussion in case we need to tweak things. Okay, um, I'd like comments from uh, from anybody else, please. I might suggest this is Steve Dar that um, irrespective of whether or not they get swapped, that there might either be a preview if they do get swapped or a a follow on. Um, I would think that three days of meetings um, would perhaps generate some worthy um, follow on activities that could be uh, highlighted as a secondary topic in the spring meeting. If it's the spring meeting and and you could certainly do a preview if it's the fall meeting. OK, I hear you loud and clear. John Kosak, go ahead, sir. Uh, yeah, just back to your original uh, topic one there primary right now um, in the uh, chat. It appears that Janet Ford has uh, um, volunteered to help as well. <laughs> I got more volunteers than I got seats. Cool. And you can put my name down also. <laughs> yeah, I was uh, now, now, now you guys don't spread yourselves so thin that that you know that, that we got nothing left for for topics two and three. So so go easy here now. <laughs> you know one two three four five six. Uh, so I don't know which of you six considers yourself to be a an, a grade A cat herder, Janet. But this thing needs a grade A cat herder for sure. And by the way, Janet volunteered Jim as well. So maybe Janet and Jim could continue their excellent leadership together. <laughs> we, can, we, can, uh, we can further discuss this. Absolutely. OK. All right. So, um, so um, any more input on the the idea of I, I want to hold on to that I want to hold on to that um, the preview postlude the, the the preview or review topic just for a minute uh, and and Steve where I'm what what I was thinking about was you know we have Tom Ryan doing an FPA topics review it could be that that the 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 FPA topics review provided that the fall meeting goes off in person could be a single topic review of the fall federal agency review and and then we could have another smaller topic in you know in this slot or where in one of the other smaller slots yeah. and I'm I guess what I guess what I'm doing is I'm I have enough I have enough interest, and I thought there was enough interest um, um, in either the the mixed phase precipitation question. Um, well, I, so so that one I don't want to I don't want to I don't want to prematurely ace out of the space unless unless the, it's overwhelmingly seen that that um, that 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 the the uh, the federal agency should have its own one hour, and then there should be the Tom Ryan led FPA topics review. In addition to that, I'll stop talking and, and get your feedback. Over. No Tom feedback. Ryan here. Hi, Tom Ryan here. Hey, uh, just wondering if the next gen status update would be a one hour or a three hour over? Uh, well, I, I will tell you what it feels like to me, but I will look to Lee and um, and and Don and Ralph and others who commented when, when the when the topic was brought up. It feels like like it deserves its own three hour, if not three day block to to talk about because it, it could go in a number of ways um, and and I think take up every bit of time that would be allocated to it. That's my opinion. 
Lee or or Ralph or Don, do you have any any thoughts on this 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 topic that that um, we, we've we've just arbitrarily called next gen status update? Well, absolutely no question. You summed it up. I mean, uh, you know, the the next gen 4D data cube was the core, the heart of everything we were trying to do in next gen weather. So getting an update on where we are and then, you know, flushing it out with better ideas if we're not there yet would be extremely helpful. So again, yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely a longer topic, but I think it doesn't hurt also to tee it up if you only have an like say you want to use the time for other things here on the list on the right. It doesn't hurt to tee it up with an update, like get an update from the FAA on on it so that the next meeting we can maybe tee it up as a topic. If you you know, if you don't want to use three hours for it at this point, you know, I just throw that idea out. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, this, this is Matt's opinion. Uh, I, I think that this is long overdue. You know, not only do we get an update from from the PMO on CSS weather and NWP, but but we start exploring some of these even more fundamental questions, such as uh, those having to do with with the integration of the weather information into decision support systems and processes, and the and and how how uncertainty is being handled and how probabilistic weather forecasts are being are, are, are being treated. I mean, I, th this this could go on for for days and weeks. Um, and and, you know, uh, to, to Ralph's point, the uh, you know, is, is there is there an heir apparent to the 40 weather cube is the is the is the National Weather Service uh, IDRP is not that's not the IDP is that is that the 40 weather cube and is there a, a a single authoritative source. And, no, yeah. no, it's not. It's not. Kill that, Matt. No, no, no. Don't even get that fake news out there. <laughs> I don't know. I, I mean, I, I don't know. It would be good to know what it is. Yeah, and no, IDP is just a date. It's just for managing data, basically. Like they're moving all their data into the cloud now to make it easily accessible. But in terms of a cube that has logic and, you know, yeah, nah. I was kidding, kind of, but not. I don't. I just want to be careful because I don't want people to think that IDP is uh, the 40 data cube. So. Okay. Well, I think there are some people in National Weather Service who would argue that it is, but maybe it'd be good to hear from them. Let's do it. <laughs> okay. Um, so Lee, you you brought this up. Um, so I to to you to the victor goes the spoils. I give you the first opportunity to participate in this topic. Would you like to do that? Yeah, of course. Uh, but I really need a lot of help. <laughs> you know, I, I I like to contribute and help get a coordinate. And okay. Really a lot, lot of help from uh, FA and uh, the the different program people. I think uh, they have more relevant content uh, to present or can contribute. Oh, well, 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 for sure. But I mean, as far as organizing this, Lee, and and you know, lining people up, and and you know, managing time and presentations, um, uh, you know, who who else can help Lee on this particular uh, topic area? Lee's a nice guy, by the way, and he's very easy to work with. <laughs> Gee, I don't know, Matt. Maybe somebody from NextGen. Uh, that's a that's a uh, uh, that, that's a pretty ballsy idea, but yeah, well, let's let's do it, Bill. Yeah, yeah why don't you? Uh, what what name comes to your your mind there? Well, I'm I'm I always like involving the big guys because they have the big stick. Wait a minute, are you calling me fat? No. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Talking about Put Bradford. my name down there. I'll work with Lee. Okay, great, great deal. <laughs> Big guys, jeez. <laughs> it, this is Don. I can't do a lot with both of these, but if he, Lee, if you need my help in like finding people in the weather service, or you know, find you know, helping you with pulling together a group that could you know contribute, let me know. I'll help. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Don. Mm -hmm. Here I'll 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 indicate that pictorially. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. 
Hey guys, this this is Mike. Can, can, maybe I missed it, but what do we mean by next gen status update? Is it just you know where are we in terms of rolling out and delivering next gen? Yeah, so we so we talked about this uh, I think before you joined Mike, but Lee had submitted a uh, a problem statement that uh, that that basically is is wanting to know, you know, we 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 had this ketchup and mustard chart in 2010, and we have this notion of ATM weather integration with uh, you know levels of integration and and all this sort of stuff and. Are we there yet, or or is that vision evolving? So I I think this is my opinion. I think there's an element of NAS Vision 2035 in here. I think there's an element of TBO in here to basically tell the story that that yes, next gen is evolving, and and you know some components of next gen have been rolled out, but in the weather area, you know m maybe not as as not in the same way that some of the non-weather components have been rolled out. Could we at least have weather in the title? Next-gen weather stuff? Otherwise, it becomes a general, let's talk about next-gen. Mm -hmm. See, I'm so easy. Does that mean you're volunteering, Bryce? It does not. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I, I actually, uh, you, you know, it, it'll it'll be up to Lee and Bill and and others, you know, to to actually evolve this this session. But I I see this one starting off in next gen, but then pointing forward and trying to tr trying to see where there are you know da dangling participles left behind and and what can to to Nancy's point, you know you know let's identify those gaps and and let's roll up the sl our sleeves and perhaps give some advice to uh, uh, you know to the industry on on where help help is needed in this area so i i, I don't know okay well i'm going to leave it there for now i know lee and 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 bill um you know you, you guys can I'm sure recruit some um, some willing and able folks. And Bill, you and I can uh, can uh, lean on Alfred a little bit and maybe get maybe get Steve or Will Brown or somebody like that to participate too. Yep, absolutely. Okay. Um, just just because we're here right now, let me let me ask um, the the notion of of a of a review of the Federal Aviation Weather TEM versus uh, the the introduction of the mixed phase precipitation question that was submitted by Matthias. Is there is there one or the other that feels like um, like like a a, a better uh, a better topic for this slot right here that I have highlighted? How about if we do it this way? Um, if or or okay, so so we can do a review of the previous fall's tem as a one-hour standalone. We could do a mixed phase precipitation to introduce the problem and give an update to uh, to to where we are with this. That would probably involve both. The folks from NCAR, Scott Landolt, and and FAA, Stephanie DeVito, and also the airlines, because there may be differing opinions about about the best way to proceed in this area, um, or we can do something different. Uh, the the something different, uh, I don't know, could be could be a, uh, a, a spectrum interference, could be something else that we haven't talked about right now. So let me let me just do it in that order. Uh, using show of hands, please. How how many people would vote? to uh, have the review of the Federal Aviation Weather Technical Exchange meeting that took place the previous fall, or the preview if these two meetings swap places. Hands up, please. Okay, I see. And John, I'm counting on you or or Dave Strand, one of the two, to to keep me honest here. I see four hands up. Are there any others that I'm just missing? That's all I saw. Okay. 
Very good. All right, hands down, please. That hands down is always the hard part for me. Very good. Okay. How many people would like to see a uh, short mixed phase precipitation discussion as the secondary topic in this slot? Uh, if you will, please hands up. Looks like we have just a wee bit more <laughs> support for that, but overall there's apathy. <laughs> oh, now oh, I, I stand corrected. Two, four. Okay, now we have two, four, six, seven, eight. So, so let let's just say, Dave, what what did you say? Seven or eight in that in that category? We got eight, eight. Two, four, six, eight. Okay, very good. Hand hands down, folks. I got to figure out how to do that too. All right. And and now let, let me open it up to the entire audience. Would what else, what other short topic would folks want to hear about if neither of those two suggestions resonate? Matt? Yes. Hey, I have a I have a topic. It's kind of a it, a wild thought. It might fit in with this though. Um and part of it I, it kind of came to me um, listening to this whole planning session. You know, we always said we're trying to get away from death from PowerPoint. And I noticed we actually have almost infinite discussions on your one sentence topics here. And I was like, you know, maybe something like that could be similar. And it sort of fits with the next gen status a little bit. Um, but it really is kind of a very just a topic more than a panel and to see if it generates discussion. So it could be very short and it could be cut off at any time because you don't have assigned briefers. And what it is, and, and Randy knows we've been talking about it, the new administration is really high on reducing global warming. And we haven't really looked at or talked about what in the weather community, across the board, industry, federal, everything, or ideas relative to weather to maybe help with efficiency or to come up with tools that better measure inefficiencies due to weather. I mean, there's a myriad of potential out there to try to enhance efficiency to reduce global warming and to reduce gaseous emissions for 121 and even GA helicopters, anybody that's non-electric from a weather standpoint. And it kind of ties a little with next gen because there is a lot of weather and efficiency and just really have it as hey, ideas and see if people can come in with research and other things where they think, and like I said, it could be tools to measure inefficiencies due to weather, ways of measuring improved efficiencies, models for that, how we might have better weather. Where do you really need better weather? Is what, you know, the lack of poor forecasts a reason or is it how it's being used? Just across the board, letting people talk and say their ideas on how because there's money out there. We've heard there's a lot of money to help with this. And I think the C6, the whole division, may be able, if we get some good ideas, might have a chance to get some of that money. Aha! Aha! And it does, it does sort of fit next gen and 2035, so they kind of go together. Well, so that's yeah. just an idea, and like I said, it would be, Literally, like you're doing this meeting, you just have to put up a couple sentences and anybody in the audience can pipe out ideas and thoughts and hopefully each thing somebody says might generate more and maybe C6 will come away with some good ideas that we can get part of that pot. Okay. Well, I, 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 um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm tickled to hear you recognize that there weren't a lot of words in in this presentation, and we're now at almost three and a half hours of chatting. So yeah, there's there's certainly a lot of interest in in these uh, in these topic areas among people, which is part of the reason, I suppose, why we're why we're still still hard at it. Now, Brandon Smith, I, I bet you I know what you want to talk about, but but I'm 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 not going to put words in your mouth. Sorry, I just missed the lower my hand button. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
Oh, 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 okay. Oh, so I thought you wanted to say something. Go ahead. No, Bill. no, it was just up from before. I apologize. Yeah, I got, got it. No problem. Go ahead, Bill. So, um, yeah, I would change the wording there that Gary um, proposed. Instead of global warming, uh, reduce carbon emissions from aircraft. That seems to be kind of a buzzword floating around Department of Transportation right now with the uh, current administration's climate change initiative. Well, right. we're going to reduce global warming. So <laughs> we're only we could reduce emissions. Yeah, there's some political things here. I see where you guys, I think, are making a good choice of words there just to make sure if you want to get the money. <laughs> yeah. Stay away from the political uh, hot, hot buttons. Yep. Yeah, yeah, the biggest savings have come from non-CO2 savings, so emissions anyway, so. Whatever gets the money. Oh, okay. <laughs> Dan Fuka, go ahead. And I, uh, off that last point, I, I like the topic. I would even go so far as removing aircraft from the, uh, from the statement because a good portion of what we provide goes into all of the uh, uh, all of the planning and uh, 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 the planning and other portions of reducing carbon emissions in other places. While we want to focus on the uh, aircraft, it would also be nice to be able to include a couple of snippets that are uh, say how we're helping the rest of the communities. I violently agree. <laughs> Well, if you guys are going to be violent with me, I'll just take that word up. Okay, let's see. Let's see. All right, well, let's let's do a let's do a show of hands on this then as a secondary topic and and, and let me say that if you have voted before but decide that I like this one better than either of the previous two that were listed, then, uh, then you get to vote again. So, uh, uh, would would folks want to have this as a short session, a short topic in the spring twenty two meeting? And if so, raise your hand. Uh oh. See, Gary, you, you should have submitted this. Uh, uh, you should have submitted this on the website, and it would have been in, turned into a big session. Well, yeah, like I said, I actually didn't think of it till. I mean, I know we've been talking internally about this, but I didn't think of it as a session because I don't really have charts or anything I would brief. But then I was like, you know, one sentence up here. You know, we've always talked death by PowerPoint, and it's like, wow, one sentence on some of these topics. And you can just stand back. So that's kind of was like, you know, maybe you don't really need any charts or anything to brief, but just say, hey, there's a big pot of money out here available to the weather community. If we come up with good ideas, what ideas do people have? And people may be able to talk. Like I said, if it's a short session at 30 minutes, if you have two hours, you know, it seems like you may get two hours worth of comments. So we can kind of let it run as much. And it is completely going to be away from the death by PowerPoint. You know, it, it's really here's a topic and hopefully we can come away. It also sort of goes back to people wanting, you know, FPA to have an impact. You know, if we can get some good ideas, th there's money out there. This administration, this is really high and we know that um, environmental, Randy said, is getting a huge pot that's going to be distributed. So, you know, it really gives us a chance to make a difference. I haven't said this yet, but uh, given your enthusiasm and... No, I don't mind leading it. Like I said, I'll put up one sentence and then stand back and let everybody from all walks of life come up with their ideas. Okay. Hey, hey, hey this is Randy. I will say that, uh, and Matt, you, you should probably know this, but this is going to be one of the uh, proposed sessions for uh, ARAM yes. in January. Yeah. So we... We could actually start this off by just having, uh, you know, maybe the co-chair of that session, whoever it may be, uh, do a do a quick synopsis of the presentations that were done then. Yep. 
Yeah. Just start it off. Yeah, yeah. That, would, that would be great if we want. I mean, it depends how long or short, you know, people want it. I don't know what a short session means, but I mean, any of that could work. It, it's certainly going to become a topic knowing the administration. I mean, this is one of the things that the administration used to get elected. They said this is huge and they seem to be throwing money at it. So I think it's only going to catch more momentum. Might be okay. worthwhile noting how far the Europeans are ahead of us in this regard, too. <laughs> Yeah. Well, that's what I said. I, I know there's a load of talking people could do on this. I mean, I can, anytime it comes up, you hear a lot of people to bring in up with thoughts and um, ideas, impressions, feelings. It's got everything in it. It gets some emotion. I mean, there are obviously a lot of people who don't even think global warming is an issue. There are other people who think we're going to die in a couple of years because of it. And it's certainly tied with weather in there, too. Yeah. Go ahead, Dan. You got it. Uh, if you wanted to take my name off of the topic one, since it's oversaturated there, uh, you can throw me down with Gary if he, if Gary doesn't mind, and I can uh, help him put That's a couple fun. of lights up on the slide. Yeah. Just a question, guys. This is Mike. Uh, I, I imagine since this is F Paul, we want to still stay in the in the weather area and not get into like alternative fuel. Correct. Yeah, big yeah, it's weather. Now, whether it has to be pure aviation, like they said, or pure aircraft, I guess yeah. is another way of saying it. But yeah, we're not going to talk alternative fuels or anything. This is what weather can do. And like I said, I know we don't have a lot of metrics now to, me you know, Wittix had some programs like that where it, it, people really haven't done a lot of research on how you show reduced emissions. I mean, there aren't a lot of products out there. There's not a lot of models. I mean, and then where, what forecasts really help with that? I mean, there's a slew of areas that are related with aviation and purely with weather. So the eVTOLs, we're seeing the carbon emissions highly dependent upon the, the local power grids. I don't know if we really want to get into that whole life cycle of generating power as part of this if you're if you're going to talk transports then you're you know a little different thing but for the ev tolls and the suas this might be a rabbit hole you might not want to go down yeah and lithium batteries and lithium mines you might want to do <laughs> that as well yeah um I, I i i made a minor word change based on this last uh conversation does does that materially does that fix it or does that make it worse It's okay. I mean, I, there's a lot of ways you could say it. I mean, we might dork the wording slightly, but that, I mean, I think you're in the area. Okay. All right. And, and, and I'm not, I'm not hung up on these words. I just, you know, and, and, and they can be, you know, they will evolve as, as, as we go on. So, uh, so, okay. It's, I think it'll be across the board, weather impacts, you know, whether it's both to enhance ways to measure it, but every, it's all around weather. We're FPA. So it's how weather and ways we can reduce emissions from a weather perspective, whether that's tools to make better decisions, whether it's better weather products, whether it's ways to take metrics to see where waste is being done because of routes and rerouting related to weather, all those things. Yep, yep. And that's why I said, I think it'll flow where people talk. It's not something we're doing a lot on, so there's not a lot to brief. It's It really is gonna be a freewheeling session, which like I said, could turn into you just stop it whenever time's up or you know nobody may raise their hand but based on the way this meeting's going it seems like um there shouldn't be a shortage of people with opinions ideas and thoughts we'll just need a note taker well and 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 i will i will i mean we you know we record these meetings yeah that works so 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 we have that but and we and we we have the chats and 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 you know all that information is captured, but uh, but uh, Nancy and Randy were having an interesting conversation in in the chat early on in this meeting, which which really really resonated with me, um, in part because of some ARAM discussions that we've had here recently, where where we were we were talking about. Um, you know how you engage younger people in this kind of stuff and one of the ways you do it is through an intern type program which which I know Randy and is 
and Nancy are both uh, very much involved with. Another way is to take people who are who are still students, whether it be post grad, you know, uh, graduate students or even undergraduate students, and say, look, we'll we'll let you get involved in this, but but in exchange for that, you got to be our note taker and summarizer at the end of of, of this conference and. Well, what, I was what, thinking Wittick's been looking at voice recognition systems. Maybe we'll see if they can actually type the whole thing out so we have a whole text file with it when we're done. Ooh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> we'll also try the MITRE speech pirate recognition software. Yeah, just well, it's, to run and record everything. Yeah, but it's it's been trained on the arcane uh, yeah. language that pilots use as opposed to uh, people in these, in, in these fora. Okay, um, the, the, to me, but this is just me, the last topic that, that seems to fit nicely and, and, and which resonated with most of the, of the folks uh, when we talked about it was this um, uh, space launch and landing weather concerns that Matthias um, submitted. But uh, but let me let me stop there and say, have I misinterpreted what I heard, or 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 uh, are, is there something else that I'm completely missing the boat on that 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 we should include in this third primary topic area? And and, and by the way, I, I would probably, you know, based on a conversation we had, re retitle or kind of reorient perhaps what Matthias uh, put in his submission, which just so you all remember was, was this. And then I added, uh, I added in some of the red text myself, but um, um, you know, we, we had some, I thought wonderful discussions about uncertainty versus risk and current capabilities and using private industry to mitigate the risk by providing uh, you know, weather information that has more certainty, which allows you to to uh, you know to 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 take on uh, some degree of additional risk and better sensing capabilities. And again, the role that private industry plays in that. And and so, I thought there was some good discussion around that, which is why my sense is that that would go into topic area number three. But uh, again, let me shut up and hear what other folks have to say. Did we, was there a thought that we were not going to have the spectrum interferences discussion on this one or? Uh, well, th this is just, this is just Matt walking away with um, an impression that, that, that this one was not as, as interesting to others, that the spectrum interference one was not as interesting to others as this one was, but perhaps, you know, this is like the phone game, right? Maybe, maybe I heard something and misinterpreted it. Which is why, which is why I'm, I'm hopeful that others besides just me and Dan will pipe in here and, and express an opinion. So I, I'm, I'm on the space. I, I like the space launch a little bit. Uh, more, but the uh, spectrum had uh, a pretty heated discussion in the spring meeting this in this go around. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, possibly a, 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 a vote on those. And OK, others. Well, I'll, I'll say that, you know, space launch is an increasing big business and uh, space weather is something that we've been trying to streamline for years. And as more airplanes fly across the poles and we return to that, I think addressing space launch and space weather in general would be highly appropriate. I, I uh, so, so let me let me push back a little, Ralph, and say that that um, that I, I it's easy to put those two together, but I'm not sure how they're related to one another, other than the fact they have the word space in them. Well, I agree with what you said, but unfortunately, in this country. Uh, the definition of space weather and weather falls into the same category. Uh, you know, I've had that discussion with NOAA and National Weather Service on many occasions. Uh, and uh, so we either A, they need to start pushing for a separate discipline called space weather, uh, or it's all part of the same deal. Don? Yeah, I don't think we should conflate the two right now, Ralph. I think one is focused on 
you know, gaps that we have in observation capabilities and, uh, and it's impacting, you know, other people and this space weather itself is another. So I agree that it needs to be addressed, but I wouldn't conflate them here. But uh, what I was going to say is um, that, you know, I think this, this problem, you know, what I like about this problem or I shouldn't like it, but what I admire about it is it's going to get us into some conversations that really do get into other areas around ROI, you know, improving density observations. I mean, we're picking a use case that gets a lot of, will get a lot of attention, but it's going to really, I think, open up the thinking around, you know, I think there's more to this, right? So that's why I like it as a, as a broad topic. And I presume Justin's over here again. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I stepped on you. I presume, uh, uh, sorry, Justin, I presume that you're, you're referring to this, the space launch and landing weather concerns topic, correct? Yes, yeah, correct. Mm -hmm. right. go, go ahead, Justin. Yeah, just, um, just to throw in two cents there again. So the, on the space weather side, think drones as well, um, because they have a drastic effect, especially on the compass on the UAS, as well as GPS navigation. So, uh, for example, today we topped out at a G3 storm, which is outside of limits for our drones to be flying in. So um, what we found is, back to Don's point, lack of data points, lack of information coming in, um, because you've got, uh, you know, less than 10 sites across the world that take in measurements of the KP index, or put the KP index back out, the average, and none of those sites fall within the latitudes in which we are operating our drones. So um, we're going off of information that is outside of our operating area to try to make an educated guess as to wh whether or not we should be flying as a result of space weather. So tie that into drones too, possible. Yeah, I, I equate it to using the LFM uh, back uh, in 1984 to try to get the 850 millibar temperature. Yes, it's kind of like that. Hey, man, now that was the first model I ever used as a forecaster. I have a lot of fond memories of the LFM. Memories of what? Getting your butt handed to you by your operator? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. Um, okay, so... Uh, so I, I thought we had I thought we had conflated, deconflated. Now I feel like we've reconflated space weather and the space launch and, and landing stuff. So I'm 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 confused yet again. I think this is a good topic, and I think everything Justin's saying is a hunt. I mean, it's a really good topic. I don't know if I conflate it with this, but I think we should get it on the list of topics in maybe the spring meeting because. What he's saying is absolutely right. What Ralph's saying is absolutely right. We are woefully inadequate in supporting the decisions of folks on, that are using GPS and communications to fly these things at providing that service. So I think it, it is a major gap. It's one I haven't focused on, but I think, you know, I think it, we, you know, it's, it's something we should get into the list, but I don't think I would mix that up, mix it up with what we're trying to solve here right now or what we discussed. Okay. I'd like to hear more conversation, though, about the spectrum interference piece. Is, is that has that is there is there no appetite to 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 do an expanded uh, spectrum interference session, for instance, at the spring meeting, um, or 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 maybe even more importantly, actually, let me do it this way. Let, let me do it this way. Here's my proposal. I'm I'm going to propose that we do the uh, weather concerns for space launch and landing as as topic number main major topic number three uh, on this list here. But if we end up having to swap the spring meeting and the fall meeting, I'm going to suggest that from a timing perspective, it would be very useful to do the spectrum interference concerns piece in the fall, especially if uh, Tom could bring in somebody who is gonna be part of this decision-making in the coming months after that. H how does that sit with y'all? Okay, well, <clears throat> I think what you bring up is very important and, uh, and a good approach. However, you know, getting a Congressman to come in and speak is good, but what we really need is for one of the key federal agencies, whether NOAA or the FAA, 
to provide us an update on what they're actually doing to mitigate uh, the spectrum changes. Okay. I, I my, my sense, Ralph, is that Tom feels like he, he can arrange for that to happen. But I'm 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 reading between a lot of lines here. Yeah, uh, this is Don. I you know we got to solve problems, right? I mean, unfortunately, I, the spectrum thing. Quite frankly, I mean, unless somebody reverses the FCC and the administration reverses what they've said, and believe me, we're the small, we're like the the teeny piece of the tail at the end of the dog on this. Um, we should be focused on what we're going to do to to mitigate the problem that it's about to be put on us. So I I, I like. I mean, Ralph, I like his approach because I don't think we're, you know, we could bring people in, we can listen to a congressman, but let me tell you, there are a lot of people working this issue. I mean, a lot, I mean, it's got, this got pretty heated uh, between the FCC and, and the Democrats. And, you know, so I think focusing on mitigation or focusing on solutions that we, to something that we know we may not be able to control, I think is a good approach. Okay, I hear that. L let let me ask this. However, D does it, it? It it seems to me like if this waits until spring, well, so so sorry. So so what I what I hear you saying, then Don, I'm I'm going to try putting words in your mouth. Is if we're going to talk about this, regardless of whether it's in the fall because it's moved up, or whether it's in the spring. You know, it's not the concerns we should be focusing on. It's the mitigation strategies that 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 are in play, and what can we do to make the best of a bad situation? Is that is that am I reading that right? Yeah, I mean, I think again, I'm speaking from a pretty good understanding of all the work that's being done. So I'm I I don't want to say that this has to be the way to do it. I mean, if we want to bring in a congressman. Uh, what I would do then is bring them in and say, here's the money we need to mitigate this, right? Like mm -hmm. maybe that's the approach, right? Uh, rather than say, hey, stop this from happening kind of thing. Okay. Okay. And, uh, you know, I don't want to put any federal agency on the spot. You know, I, I don't want a congressman to come in and talk and then we have a conversation and he comes to the conclusion that there's a problem and the uh, federal agencies aren't doing anything about it. And then, you know, they get hate mail or something like that. I've, I've had plenty of pre congressional engagements, and these things can go awry on you pretty easy. <laughs> I heard your, uh, Ralph, I, I chuckled at your, uh, at your lead in at the, at, at, uh, the FPOM session you were in a couple of weeks ago when you said, I don't do PowerPoints anymore. <laughs> and why? So I, I, I think I understand what you're saying. Okay, so so here here is so my proposal is that is that we will put in here in this primary topic area the weather concerns for space launch and landing, and um, we're probably gonna have to find somebody to work that uh, either that or heck I don't know maybe maybe well we'll find somebody to work it I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say that <laughs> and and uh, well, yeah if you need. If you need somebody, I'm more than happy happy to help because I obviously ran a lot of space launch missions. Yeah. What whatever happened to the rule that the person that puts the idea out and doesn't show up for the meeting becomes the the lead? I I, I thought that was a standard government issue. If, if if I was at all antagonistic toward Matthias, he'd be leaving this session right now. But I'm very fond of him and don't want to. Uh, don't don't want to destroy that relationship. You know that was tongue in cheek, right? Of course. Of course. And, and Ralph, I'm going to put you after the comma to indicate that you're not you're not volunteering to to be the head dog, but just a dog. I still think we should put Matthias in there. <laughs> I'll I'll give him why the. A, why don't we do a vote? Hey, why don't we do a vote? Then you can get off the hook. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, 
My problem, unfortunately, is that, and this is the same thing, this would be like me volunteering Mike Robinson for this spot. I, I know a little bit more about how busy Mike is and how busy Matias is than the average bear, and I'm just not willing to do that. I'm sure that Matias will will say, well, I've all, you know, I, I put it up there, so I should probably lead it, but I'm going to let him do that. So let me let me work on that angle offline. But but the, 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 what I want to say here is this is for spring only. And and uh, and if, if we end up with a fall virtual session. Um, We'll go with something like that. And 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 just so you know, Ralph, that that would uh, unless you wanted it to, that would that would so it'd be like this. Hang on a second. Nah, I'm gonna screw this up. I hate doing I hate doing editing on the fly. It's no fun. Uh, I, R Ralph, I have your name here only for the space launch and landing, not for the spectrum interference uh, piece, unless you unless you want to do that too. No, no, I, I, I don't want to get uh, subjugated to overall interiors. <laughs> okay. So when the only other possible thing that I'd run by is since the secondary topic on day two is actually discussing things that people were discussing about uh, bitching and or not, sorry, not that word, um, uh, discussing <laughs> about, uh, uh, money allocation. Right. It, uh, that uh, I would actually suggest that these might these might be better primaries to that secondary since if there is a spectrum interference uh and we do have uh higher higher level people with us then uh, then join and then uh, grouping the fiscally rewarding one with that one might might be a benefit if it, uh, if a person is speaking and he sees that the next thing up is um is also related to what he's voting on. Yeah, and 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 Dan, the 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 pairings here are completely arbitrary right now. But what I hear you saying is if is if we went with this due to circumstances, then it should probably be paired with this. Is that correct? Uh, fiscally, if if we're considering fiscal opportunity. Yes. And I think that's what Gary was suggesting. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, we, we can do that uh, again. Th these these are only here just filling in a a a, um, a, um, a box to be checked at this point in time. Hey, Matt, while you're cleaning that up, just one more note. Uh, Nancy uh, made another comment uh, about a suggestion for that uh, secondary uh, topic number two. In the chat, OK, uh, are you still on Nancy? I, uh, I had, uh... Yes, yeah. it, it broadens it, but I mean, it's for, just for consideration, the role of aviation weather in enabling sustainability and equity, but the, you, that might be too broad. Definitely would definitely be a lively conversation. Okay, I'm see, I'm looking at it now. Sorry, my, my silence is, uh, reading okay um so uh so, so well, look, well let me ask you this nancy w would you be would you be willing to be one of the uh one of the the folks that that uh, that that for this particular session is responsible to write these one sentence conversation starters and then let it go back and and and, and then monitor that conversation. Um, I could throw, I could throw it out there because I mean, we're having some of the conversation around exactly what is sustainability and and get the conversation started. Um, but like I said, it would I I agree with Gary. 
understanding what we can do with the ideas would be important so that we get those out of the conversation. Yep. Yep. Okay. Very good. All right. I, I have accomplished what I had hoped to accomplish, and I can now report back to Matthias that um, that somehow or another we we filled in all the blanks and uh, and even even um, kind of sort of assigned him to one of those. So I conversed your bubble, Matt. How about oh. the ongoing FPA topics review? Yes, sir. Oh, so you're saying, so what are we reviewing? Is that what you're saying, Tom? Well, sort of-ish, yes. Um, I, I honestly hadn't thought that far, to be perfectly honest, and, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm confident that between you and me and, and Matthias that we can reach back and, and uh, you know, pull out one or two that have had something go on in the meanwhile that is worth reporting back to, to FPA. So I'm... I'm I guess what I'm saying in so many words is I am completely not worried about it as long as you're willing to to ride herd over. It. Yeah, well, as long as we have topics, I can do it. Yeah, I'm sure we do. I'm comfortable. Okay. Uh, And by the way, that's where Matthias is right now. So, and that's what he's doing. So I've, I've used a code word here for him. Okay. All right. I've got like two minutes left in the meeting, maybe one. Any other topics that anybody wants to bring up or any other bubbles that anybody wants to burst or try? If not, going once. Going twice, I will clean this up, and uh, this will be available on the FPA website, along with the meeting uh, recording and the chat log, et cetera, et cetera, in the coming days. Thank you very much, everybody who hung in there for the whole four hours, for hanging in there, for providing your, your excellent, excellent feedback, and uh, we'll be talking to you soon. Bye-bye.